Inaka Yuuiki, a standard office worker, had grown weary of his high-pressure job. As he left work, his eyes tired, he slowly crossed the street. Suddenly, a truck, moving at the speed of light, came barreling down the road, heedless of the pedestrians, its driver shouting warnings in vain. The driver, still asleep at the wheel, failed to stop the speeding vehicle. Inaka's documents flew into the air as a bright white light appeared before him. He remembered his childhood days, life in the countryside was so carefree, without the constant worry of making ends meet. Alfred, you're sleeping here again? Eleonora's voice rang out. Alfred, just three years old, awoke and rubbed his eyes. He was actually Inaka Yuiwiki, who had died in a truck accident. The young girl before him was Eleonora Slolet, aged nine. She took his hand and led him home. Noticing his tiredness, Eleonora asked in surprise, are you okay, Alfred sighed. In his past life, he was a hard-working office employee who also had to train in magic. If he didn't use magic, his body would weaken, and his energy could only be replenished through sleep. Even his naps were disrupted by Eleonora. She's like a haunting spirit, he thought quietly, recalling the moment after his death. God appeared before him, explaining that this was not Earth. For some unexplainable reason, Alfred's soul had ended up here. He was given a choice, reincarnate in this world with a new identity. Alfred was astonished, thinking about the dangers of reincarnating in an unfamiliar world. Seeing Alfred's concern, God reassured him, saying there was no need to worry. This world had humans like Earth, but instead of science, people here used magic. Monsters, different from humans, attacked people. Deep in thought, Alfred pondered if this magical world could offer him the comfortable life he always desired. God, sensing Alfred's anxiety, promised him a precious item. The choice to reincarnate into any identity, be it a prince or the son of a noble family, and especially the ability to use magical talents and ancient magic. Alfred was astonished upon hearing about magic. So I can fly like a bird in the sky and command monsters to do tasks, he thought. Determined, Alfred now had a new goal, to live a joyful and comfortable life in the countryside. After sharing his intentions with God, Alfred looked up expectantly. God pondered, scratching his head, and then decided, you shall be the second son of a lord in the countryside. God then asked what kind of magic Alfred desired. Lying on a drifting cloud, Alfred contemplated. Should he choose healing defense? No, it had to be something more liberating and cool, something beneficial for his new life. Remembering God's words about the culture in the land of Koliat being equivalent to Earth's medieval times, he realized transportation might be limited. What about teleportation magic? Alfred suggested eagerly. Without hesitation, God agreed and stood up, looking into Alfred's eyes. Are you ready to go to the new world? Alfred stood as well, gratefully acknowledging God. Thank you for everything. God gradually faded away, and a vortex of light swirled around Alfred, his consciousness blurring. In Akin Yuji, now Alfred, was reborn in another world. In the village of the Misfrit Kingdom, he was Alfred Slolet, the three-year-old second son of Lord Slolet. He toddled along the corridor, occasionally tumbling over. In his previous world, Inakin was an inconspicuous employee, but after being hit by the truck, he found himself in this magical world with loving parents and siblings. The language here was not much different from Japanese, and despite being in a child's body, he retained the memories of his past life, so moving around wasn't too difficult. Alfred decided to spend the day reading in the library. Hello there baby, greeted Severo Slolet, Alfred's six-year-old brother, though actually a girl. Severo told Alfred that if he had any questions while reading, he could ask him directly. Alfred really liked this calm and collected brother, so different from his eldest sister Eleonora. It was very comfortable being around him. The weather was beautiful today, prompting Alfred to change his plans. He headed to a secret room known only to him. Before him was a table where he practiced spatial magic. Focusing intently on a stone in his hand, he envisioned his destination. Instantly, the stone vanished, reappearing on the opposite table. Gradually, branches and flowers joined the stone, floating in the air. Alfred, now adept at manipulating small objects, wiped the sweat from his brow, marveling at the wonder of magic. He vividly recalled his meeting with God in a dream, where he learned to increase his magical power by using and continuously replenishing it. 
Therefore, Alfred had been practicing magic since he was in diapers. He mused that with this power, he wouldn't need to do household chores or carry heavy objects anymore. Now his goal was to understand the rules of spatial magic. Facing a rock half his size, Alfred approached and hugged it, lifting with all his might. He focused intensely, and the large rock disappeared, swiftly reappearing, hovering over the table. He realized the larger the object, the more mana it required. Shifting his focus to a beetle, Alfred decided to try teleporting a living creature. Unsurprisingly, the beetle vanished and reappeared on the table. Suddenly, another beetle appeared behind Alfred and started chasing him. Perhaps it was seeking revenge for the teleported beetle. They played a game of chase for 30 minutes. Returning to the table, Alfred prepared to practice with a leaf. Unexpectedly, Eleonora appeared behind him, startling him with a shout. Alfred turned around to find Eleonora smiling and approaching, asking for some ice to cool down. Annoyed, Alfred told her she should knock before entering. Eleonora laughed, teasing him, were you doing something embarrassing? Alfred felt a mix of embarrassment and anger, thinking if there was a next time, he would use his spatial magic to drop something on Eleonora's head, or maybe stuff a cucumber in her pants. Lost in these thoughts, he didn't notice Eleonora standing behind him. She playfully punched him on the head, commenting on his silly expression, and urged him to hurry up. Eleonora held out a plate in front of Alfred. Ice magic in this world was a top-tier water spell, more useful than just cooling things down. Alfred conjured a block of ice onto Eleonora's plate, but she seemed dissatisfied, hinting that she wanted something crunchy and instantly edible. Realizing she meant shaved ice, Alfred placed two plates on the table and waved his hands over them. Fine ice crystals began to fill the plates. Eleonora's eyes sparkled with admiration as she praised Alfred, who blushed, still shy despite being complimented many times. Eleonora stared at the shaved ice with a small spoon in hand, while Alfred wondered if he should continue practicing magic. Deciding against it, he took a portion of shaved ice to his brother Silvio. Before leaving, Alfred suggested to Eleonora that the ice would taste better with a bigger spoon and promised to make more if she finished it. Eleonora pondered briefly but decided it was worth it, having a brother who could make shaved ice, a walking refrigerator. After reassuring Alfred, she started scooping large bites, but as she reached the last piece, Alfred had already run off. Eleonora, frustrated, yelled out a threat to Alfred, who smugly thought to himself about her naivety. Alfred handed a plate of shaved ice to Silvio, who was in the kitchen. Seeing Chef Bartolo, Alfred asked if he could use the kitchen for a bit. Bartolo, skeptical, thought Alfred was there for snacks, doubting his cooking skills. However, cooking wasn't hard for Alfred, as he often cooked for himself in his previous life. After Bartolo's approval, Alfred decided to make spaghetti, considering rice dishes, but remembering that Koliet Village didn't have rice, which made him miss Japanese lunchtimes. Bartolo rolled up his sleeves to help, and soon, two plates of spaghetti were ready. Sitting down, Alfred tasted a bite, and Bartolo, astonished, tried it too. His eyes widened, and he blurted out an expletive, then looked at Alfred differently, deciding to learn this dish within three days and add it to the main menu. Three days later, a spaghetti storm had swept through the Slowlit household. The family ate with relentless praise, ensuring that the culinary scope of Alfred's home would be expanding significantly. Next to the city wall, on a vacant lot, Eleonora was practicing swordsmanship with Silvio. Her confident and strong stance contrasted with Silvio's trembling and insecure grip on his sword. Silvio didn't really like sword fighting, he only learned it for self-defense, preferring to study and read books. Alfred, secretly envious, wondered if he could handle a sword at the age of six. Alfred's mother, noticing him sitting alone, came over and offered him a sword to try. Alfred waved his hand in refusal, preferring to watch and focus on his love for magic, occasionally reading books. His mother laughed, amused to find that her youngest son preferred such a leisurely life. On the other side, Eleonora finished her practice and ran over to Alfred, excitedly inviting him to play. Their mother advised Eleonora to bathe at home, rejecting her suggestion to bathe in the river. After getting ready, Eleonora joined Alfred by the stream. Alfred skillfully threw a stone into the water, making it skip seven or eight times before sinking. Eleonora, amazed, had never seen such a game. 
She excitedly grabbed Alfred's shoulder and shook it, asking what he was doing. Alfred explained and watched with amusement as Eleonora eagerly tried the new game. Soon, she became even better than Alfred, her teacher. Quietly walking ahead, Alfred admired Koliath's serene landscape. Eleonora, growing bored of the game, quickly followed him. How about we go fishing? Alfred quickly suggested a new game before Eleonora could say anything. She replied, let's go swimming instead. Alfred sighed, his sister seemed to have a knack for tracking him, despite his ability to teleport far away. She didn't like fishing, finding it quickly boring, but then an idea popped into her head. What if they fished and ate their catch on the spot? Without waiting for Alfred's response, Eleonora hurried off to find fishing rods. Alfred sighed again, his mother was right Eleonora was always the most enthusiastic. He quickly teleported away to escape her, arriving at the food storage area. Peering through the crack in the door, he saw Uncle Bartolo inside. Alfred opened the door widely and curiously asked Bartolo what he was doing. Uncle Bartolo, holding a jar of sugar, got startled by Alfred's arrival and explained that it was a rare gift from his friend Nord, not needed by him, so he planned to use it for a secret cooking experiment. Fearing Alfred might shout out, Bartolo quickly covered the boy's mouth. Suddenly, Maid Sarah appeared at the storeroom door, there to check on the supplies. They couldn't let her discover the sugar jar. Alfred quickly diverted the topic by asking Sarah for a fishing rod, intending to distract her so Bartolo could hide the sugar, with the condition that half of it would be shared with him. Reluctantly, Bartolo agreed. After successfully sending Sarah away and getting the fishing rod, Alfred returned to fish with Eleonora, who of course won again. It seemed like Eleonora never lost at games like this. On another beautiful day, Alfred lay under a tree, enjoying the cool breeze, a contrast to the harsh summer sun in Japan. Lost in thought, he was startled by Bartolo, who teasingly asked why he was grinning so foolishly. Surprised to see Bartolo, Alfred realized he was still alive. Rewinding to a few days earlier, after Bartolo had hidden the sugar jar and deceived Maid Sarah, they secretly held a sweet pastry party. However, while enjoying their sweets, Maids Asari and Bareta caught them. The maids questioned the origin of the pastries since there were no records of sugar purchases and decided to report this. After the incident, Alfred got a lecture from his mother and Eleonora, while Bartolo's whereabouts were unknown. Now it seemed he was safe. Alfred asked Bartolo if the rest of the goods were secure, and Bartolo proudly replied that there wasn't much left. Alfred was pleased, still wanting to try more pastry. Bartolo shared that the cream sauce pasta was almost perfected, and he was eager for it, already tired of spaghetti. They both agreed to give their best. After Bartolo left, Alfred pondered what to do next and decided to read a book. His mother, Elna, seeing him, decided that today she would teach him about magic. Alfred smiled shyly, as he hadn't practiced any magic today. Eleonora informed her that Alfred could use both water and earth magic. Secretly, the boy thought that including space magic, he could manipulate eight elements. Elna asked him to demonstrate his magic. Alfred extended his hand, summoning the earth beneath him, silently reciting an incantation, and suddenly a chair materialized before them. Elna gasped in surprise as Alfred then stretched out his hand, and from the ground, two glasses filled with sparkling ice emerged, where he had taken the earth, a small, beautiful bush grew. He handed Elna a cup of ice, and she thanked him, realizing Alfred was proficient in four elements including ice magic. Perhaps she should create a separate training list for him. Elna inquired if Alfred knew any offensive magic. The boy replied that everyday life magic was sufficient for him. Later, Elna and Nord, realizing his talent, asked if he wanted to attend a magic school. Unsurprisingly, Alfred declined, preferring to enjoy life as a child. Outside the slow-lit castle gates, Alfred and his father, Nord, were preparing to patrol around the village. According to Nord, it was a tradition for the Lord's son to visit the village upon turning four. Alfred, having heard this from his mother, was not surprised. Their house was only a field away from the village, a place he had often visited. Alfred thought to accurately teleport, he needed to visualize the paths to various locations. After visiting this village, he could visit anywhere he wished. Gazing at the vast hills and fields, Alfred delightedly thought how beautiful the country roads were, like a soft green carpet, 
not just the scent of leaves but also the earthy aroma, explaining his love for the countryside. Nord, seeing his excited son as they neared the village, pointed out the scenery ahead. Alfred, amazed, realized this was Colyet village. He asked his father what crops they grew. Nord replied they cultivated wheat, barley, black barley, legumes, fruits and vegetables, and also raised chickens, sheep, and probably cows too. As the father and son duo walked along, they suddenly encountered two farmers who enthusiastically greeted Nord, thinking he had taught the village the spaghetti recipe. They really liked it. Nord smiled and clarified that the spaghetti recipe was actually Alfred's creation. The farmers were surprised, asking Alfred's age, and remarked how calm and different he seemed compared to them, hardly believing he was the creator of that delicious. Before parting ways, one of the farmers patted Alfred's head, urging him to grow up strong like his father. Alfred cheekily responded that the farmer should also work hard and not think too much about his wife's figure. The man was taken aback, wondering how Alfred knew what he was thinking. It was indeed strange. Continuing their journey, Alfred observed the trading practices of the villagers, realizing that the market activities revolved solely around bartering goods. He commented to Nord that this could stagnate Koliath's economy. Nord agreed but pointed out that even if they spent little time trading, it wouldn't necessarily improve the villagers' lives. Koliath was prosperous, and the residents had a rich livelihood, but being a small village, they paid low taxes to the royal court. While talking, the village head approached them. He greeted Nord and then acknowledged Alfred as the young master of the Slolet family. After exchanging pleasantries, the village head had a private matter to discuss with Nord. Understanding the situation, Alfred quickly asked his father for permission to explore the area, though he had another task in mind. He planned to go shopping. After wandering around the market and gathering all the necessary items cooking ingredients, spices, wood, etc., Alfred teleported them back to the storage warehouse. The storage space could preserve the food for a long time without spoilage. Alfred marveled internally at the wonder of magic. Returning to Nord's location, Nord took Alfred to taste the local cuisine. The owner of the tavern Syria was delighted to see Nord, grateful for the spaghetti recipe that brought more customers to her establishment. This was the second time that day Nord introduced his son to the villagers. The tavern owner, seeing Alfred, eagerly asked if he had any other recipes to share. As they walked, Alfred pondered and then replied that he did have a few other recipes, but he hadn't prepared enough tools and ingredients to complete them. Syria suggested he could try visiting the blacksmith Logan, who, despite being grumpy, was highly skilled. Alfred's eyes sparkled at the idea. Why hadn't he thought of the blacksmith? The exploration trip with his father ended, and now he could teleport anywhere he wished. Things were getting more interesting. After the visit to the village with Nord, Alfred had gathered enough tools to create what he wanted. First, he cut a plank into several squares, then carved a grid onto them, followed by cutting small pieces of wood into round shapes and finally painting one side black. The finished product. A reversey board game. Holding the board, Eleonora appeared and excitedly asked what it was. Startled, Alfred turned and explained to her that the game was called Othello where the aim is to convert the opponent's pieces to your color. For instance, if she trapped a white piece between two black ones, the white would turn black, and whoever had more of their color on the board at the end would win. Eleonora, intrigued, immediately challenged Alfred, declaring she would turn the entire board her color. The siblings sat opposite each other in the room with the board game. Alfred let his sister go first, Eleonora, thrilled, agreed, but soon became frustrated, slamming the table in disbelief at her impending loss. She bowed her head down, then suddenly looked up laughing, exclaiming how fun the game was and urging Alfred to play another round. They continued playing for hours until it got dark, with Alfred eventually resting his head on the table in exhaustion, while Eleonora still wanted to play. Elna opened the door to call them for dinner and was surprised to see the board game. Eleonora explained to her mother that Alfred had discovered the game and taught her how to play. Alfred felt skeptical, and sure enough, Elner replaced him and sat down to play with Eleonora. Alfred quietly slipped away to the dining room, while Elna and Eleonora continued their game. Seeing Alfred return alone, Nord sent Silvio to check what the ladies were doing in the room. 
After a while, with no one returning, Nord, frustrated, went to look for them himself. Annoyed, he confiscated the board game and banned it from being played again. The next day, for the happiness of everyone, Alfred decided to make another reversey board. While he was busy, he ran into Uncle Bartolo. Seeing Alfred, Bartolo grinned slyly, having heard about his new invention. He hugged Alfred tightly, pleading for one of his own. Alfred reluctantly agreed, but realized that he was running out of materials and would need to visit the village to buy more. Moreover, he had to visit blacksmith Logan to make additional cooking tools for new recipes. For a comfortable and peaceful life, he needed to keep striving. After causing a sensation with his spaghetti recipe, Alfred used magic to teleport to the village again, intending to meet blacksmith Logan. Passing through the market, he overheard women chatting about food and their husbands, reflecting that no matter the world, these seemed to be common topics. He thought if his pancake recipe was released, it could cause quite a stir. Reaching the forest outside the village, Alfred approached Logan's house and peered in, asking if Logan was home. Inside, a bearded man was hammering hot iron. Logan, thinking the visitor was just a child looking to cause trouble, dismissed him emotionlessly. Alfred quickly explained that he wanted Logan to craft some items for him. Logan impatiently told him not to bother, as he had no time for play. Predicting this response, Alfred pretended to be disappointed and mentioned that Syria had assured him Logan would help. This caught Logan's attention, who then asked what Alfred wanted him to make. Logan's specialties included pans, agricultural tools, scissors, and even swords. Alfred explained his request for a square-shaped pan with a slightly raised handle. Realizing his description might be confusing, he magically summoned a notebook and pen to sketch the pan for Logan. A week later, the custom-made tools arrived, and Alfred was very pleased. Logan, curious about the strange items, asked what Alfred planned to do with them. Alfred replied that if Logan wanted to know, he should let him borrow the kitchen along with some eggs. Observing Alfred skillfully mend the holes in the wall, Logan was taken aback by the young boy's adept use of magic. As Alfred cracked eggs into a bowl, he mentioned that ever since he realized the convenience of using magic, he had been practicing daily. He poured the eggs into the pan, expertly rolling them into layers, and soon, a neatly shaped square omelet was ready, lying on a clean round plate. Logan, who had never seen an omelet made in such a shape, was amazed. After tasting a piece, he confirmed it was delicious. He had eaten omelets many times, but rolling the eggs into layers made them more visually appealing. Logan realized that if this cooking method became popular, there would be a high demand for the square pans. He decided it would be wise to start preparing them in advance. With the new tools and Logan's help, Alfred could shop for new items without any trouble, creating another sensation in the village. After completing his practice, Alfred looked back at his achievements of the day. Two sturdy houses stood before him in the countryside, filled with empty land. He planned to build himself a large resort next time. Visiting Sirius Tavern, she informed him that they had organized a reversey tournament, which attracted a large crowd. Alfred inquired if they had enough boards for the tournament. It turned out that the carpenter Herman had supplied a large number of boards, managing to complete them just in time for the tournament. The prize for the winner was a match against the game's creator Alfred. Syria introduced him to the champion of the tournament, her daughter Carla. A reversey board was quickly set up for their match, drawing an eager crowd. Carla declared that despite being 12, she wouldn't go easy on Alfred. They shook hands and dove into the game. Initially, Carla was confident, but after several moves, Alfred won by a significant margin. Carla, undeterred and optimistic, was certain she would win next time. Her cheerful disposition mirrored her mother Syria. As more customers flocked to the tavern, drawn by the spaghetti and the layered omelet, Carla rolled up her sleeves to help her mother with the increased demand. Alfred teleported back home, and after a nap, he went to the kitchen to find Uncle Bartolo. Passing by the maid's lounge, Alfred overheard them gossiping about him, their flattering words making him blush. They were also discussing the omelette recipe, wondering if adding sugar would change its taste. Alfred was curious about who they had heard this from and decided he needed to tell Bartolo. Quickly making his way to the kitchen, he found Bartolo busy with a pile of ingredients, experimenting with a new dish starting with tomatoes and green onions. 
After hearing about the maids possibly knowing about the omelette recipe, Bartolo was shocked and hurried to hide the remaining sugar jar. The two of them looked like bosses in a contraband trade. Suddenly, maid Mina appeared, loudly asking Bartolo if adding white sugar would make the omelet better. Bartolo, sweating and holding several small sugar jars, stuttered that they were salt. Mina, not convinced, dipped her finger to taste and realized it was sugar, and her intuition told her there was more to it. She began searching around frantically, with Bartolo begging her to stop, pleading for mercy. Alfred sighed in relief, thankful that he had stored it in his magical storage space. What a marvelous power magic was. Now six years old, Alfred was facing academic challenges like mathematics, history and rituals. Eleonora, sitting in front of him, was struggling with math, unable to understand why it was calculated that way. Elna, disheartened, wondered how her daughter could excel in swordsmanship but be so poor at math. Eleonora, with renewed enthusiasm, declared she wanted to be the strongest knight in the region, not wanting to lose to anyone except her father. Elna felt helpless with her daughter. Alfred turned to look at his brother Silvio, who seemed cooler than Eleonora. Rumor had it that Silvio was quite a ladies' man lately, and Alfred felt a tinge of jealousy, sure that Silvio pretended not to know. Noticing her son's silence, Elna asked if he didn't understand something. Alfred sighed softly, not wanting to finish his homework too quickly as his mother would give him more. He replied that he wanted to go outside to play. To his wish, Elna agreed on the condition that he finished all of today's homework. Pretending the homework was difficult and he didn't understand any of it, Alfred quickly wrote down the answers and soon, the completed homework was in front of Elna. After checking his work, Alfred, with his hands in his pockets, stepped outside the door. Stretching leisurely, he ran into his father Nord, who, knowing Alfred had finished his homework and was allowed outside, invited him to practice swordsmanship. The suggestion struck Alfred like a bolt from the blue, but he reluctantly followed his father, swinging the sword in his hand. Nord stood by, instructing on the grip, the stance, and the 100 swings. Exhausted after the practice, Alfred was drenched in sweat. His father praised him, noting Alfred's swordsmanship had improved, they would continue in the afternoon. Alfred gasped for air, wishing he had stuck to math instead, not wanting to train at all. In front, Eleonora and Silvio, having finished their lessons, were dueling with swords. With a shout, Eleonora lunged forward, while Silvio, in stark contrast to his sister, sweated bullets in response. Sure enough, after three moves, Eleonora won again, leaving Silvio in tears, clutching his head in pain. Eleonora then challenged Alfred. The onlookers laughed at the scene. Alfred initially refused but eventually had to duel with his father, ending up much like Silvio. At the house Alfred built himself, a one-eyed old man was lying on the floor with his mouth agape asleep. Entering the house, Alfred was shocked and ran over, but the man showed no sign of waking. After a while, Alfred softly called out, Uncle, it's lunchtime. The one-eyed man quickly sprang up, loudly asking who mentioned lunch. Seeing a boy in front of him, he asked who the youngster was. Alfred replied that it was his house and he should be the one asking. Learning the man's name was Roomba, Alfred immediately thought of the vacuum cleaner. He lent Roomba the bathroom to bathe and wash his clothes as the man was quite smelly. Roomba emerged refreshed from the bathroom and Alfred handed him a cold beer. Roomba was surprised that such a young boy could use magic. The only person he knew who could use ice magic was the princess of this country. Alfred asked if he was from the Empire. Roomba didn't answer, focusing on filling his stomach first. Looking at the famous plate of spaghetti in front of him, Roomba's mouth watered. He knew of this dish from a merchant he knew named Trila. Alfred recognized Trila as a street vendor who often visited Koliad village. Alfred asked Roomba about his purpose for coming here. It turned out that Roomba was one of the adventurers of this country, specifically a B-rank, level 4 adventurer, just below ranks SS, S and A. He had a passion for exploration, enjoying visiting different villages. While unsure of his next destination, he met Trila, who introduced him to Koliat. So Roomba came here, though the village was far from the capital and quite exhausting to reach. Alfred pondered, 
Recently, there had been many immigrants to the village. He wondered why Roomba was here, but as the village was peaceful and cozy, perhaps he would stay for a few days. Alfred asked if Roomba had found a suitable lodging yet. Roomba was very interested in Alfred's house, with its bathroom and kitchen. However, upon learning it was Alfred's second house, and that he lived in a lord's mansion, a bit far from the village, Roomba was surprised. Alfred then introduced himself as Nord Slowlit's youngest son. Hearing this name, Roomba was shocked and exclaimed, The Dragon Slayer Nord. He recounted an incident many years ago in the capital, where a ferocious dragon wreaked havoc, and a man named Nord played a key role in its defeat. Roomba, having fought alongside Nord just once, still vividly remembered Nord's heroic figure. Roomba, with sparkling eyes, turned to Alfred and asked to be taken to the mansion, wanting to see Nord again. At the slowlit mansion, Roomba waited but didn't see Nord. Instead, Elna, smiling, came out. Seeing Elna, Roomba blurted out, You're the one who was head over heels for Nord. Elna, embarrassed and blushing, asked Roomba not to bring up the past. Roomba laughed, saying he knew Elna still remembered him. Alfred thought it was the first time he had seen Elna in such a state, as she was always a proper and dignified lady in front of others. Realizing her son was still watching, Elna awkwardly turned to Alfred and mentioned there was some candy in the room for him to take. Alfred, knowing his mother wanted to save some face, still wanted to say one last thing before leaving the room, commenting that her flustered face was very cute. Roomba burst into laughter, thumping the table heartily. Stepping outside, Alfred saw Nord approaching and, feigning surprise, shouted, The Dragon Slayer. The nearby maid was startled, thinking she had misheard, while Nord paled, still recovering from the shock when Alfred ran away wondering who had told him about that embarrassing nickname. The next day, at the open field beside the city wall, Roomba was sword fighting with Eleonora. Seeing this, Nord wanted to practice with his son Alfred, who reluctantly agreed. Suddenly, Nord tripped Alfred, who fell hard on the ground, looking up with a face full of discontent, realizing this was punishment for what he said the day before. Nord's smile looked quite sinister. The two quickly started sword fighting, with Alfred's mother interrupting, and Alfred realized his parents were exacting revenge for yesterday's comments. He gritted his teeth and tried to counter Nord's moves. Nord challenged Alfred to try hitting him once, warning that the sword might accidentally hit Alfred's head. Alfred smirked and replied that it didn't matter. What mattered was that he would never forget his father's nickname as a dragon slayer. After saying that, time seemed to stop for Alfred, a chill running down his spine as Nord swung his sword in a fiery, cool stance. Alfred, with his unmeasured mouth, was sent flying and landed upside down on a grass cushion, silently opening his eyes to the blue sky. No one, including Roomba, saw how Nord moved. In the Slowlit's bedroom, Alfred slowly opened his eyes to find Eleonora and Roomba saying he was finally awake. His consciousness blurred, he began piecing together his memories. Eleonora, worried her brother might keep sleeping, shook him vigorously, asking repeatedly if he was okay. Roomba, sensing something amiss, advised her to stop, and she did, out of concern for her brother's fish-like face. Roomba, checking Alfred's forehead for a fever, told Eleonora it was all fine now. Then he mentioned that since he won their little duel, he had the privilege to take Alfred with him tomorrow, meaning the boy would be his for the entire day. Recalling this, Eleonora was annoyed. She had been exhausted from sword fighting with Roomba, an experienced and cunning old fighter who had been taunting her, so she couldn't afford to lose, making Roomba highly regard her. She had a serious fighting spirit, befitting the daughter of a dragon slayer. Eleonora told Roomba not to go easy on her just because she was a child. But Roomba would never think that way, especially with a potential opponent like Eleonora. He taught her how to make sword strikes, to utilize the resources in her body, and to use her agility as an advantage, honing and combining these skills. Roomba, having lived twice as long as Eleonora, had a body trained and seasoned with experience and endurance far surpassing hers. He pointed out her reckless and unfounded attacks, which couldn't harm someone as experienced as him. Hearing this, Eleonora's face lit up with gratitude, and she wanted another match with Roomba. He agreed, but with a condition, whoever lands a hit first gets to spend a whole day with Alfred. 
Both agreed, and when the outcome was clear with Roomba as the victor, Eleonora, exhausted, sat down at the base of a tree, disappointed at her near victory. Back to reality, Roomba left the room with a smug smile, leaving the siblings alone. Eleonora turned to her brother, mentioning that water and fruit were placed there in case Alfred didn't have the strength and she could feed him. Alfred smiled and declined the kind offer. Eleonora turned away, pouting, then said goodbye to Alfred and left the room, giving him time to rest. She really wanted to feed Alfred. He appreciated her kindness, feeling a warmth in his heart, knowing how much they cared for him. But thinking about resting in his room all day, Alfred felt the sky was incredibly beautiful today. After a day of resting due to his injuries, the next morning Roomba took Alfred out. Wanting to explore the village, Roomba had already persuaded Alfred to be his tour guide while he was still in bed. Alfred planned to take him to some delicious spots in the village to dazzle him. Passing through the wheat fields, Roomba was amazed by their vastness and beauty. In autumn, the vibrant green wheat turns golden yellow, always welcoming visitors to the village with warmth. Alfred took Roomba to the square, bustling with people. Trila had mentioned to Roomba that it was a common place for trade. In Koliet village, the deeper they went into the square, the more compact the infrastructure and house arrangements became. Based on the circumstances of the various shops and workplaces, the residents' homes also varied. For example, Sirius store was in a busy area frequently visited by people, while Logan's workplace was in the outskirts of the village due to noise pollution and the ease of finding wood for fuel. This explained why many houses were built near the center, except for those of long-term residents who were industrial workers. Passing by Herman's house, Roomba was amazed by the craftsmanship of the house, having never seen such items before. He was curious about everything, even the local specialties. Alfred thought this might be a characteristic of adventurer. He remembered how Roomba, after tasting his spaghetti, acted like a starving man saved from death. Alfred wondered if adventurers didn't always carry food and drink in their bags. Roomba explained that he usually prepared adequately before arriving in a town, but gave away all he had to people he met along the way who were in dire straits. They needed it more than he did. This was why Roomba ended up sleeping in Alfred's house, with his supplies depleted, barely able to drag himself to sleep. Alfred pondered, unaware that so many slum areas existed in the village. Seeing Roomba hungry, he led him to Syria's diner. Roomba proudly showed Alfred a gold coin, but in Koliat village gold coins were rarely used, and one gold coin for a breakfast seemed too extravagant. With a faded smile, the two headed to Syria's diner. Entering the room, Roomba was surprised at its size, having never seen such a large noodle shop. Suddenly, a cry of despair rang out. It was Roland, the farmer from the wheat field Alfred and Nord had met earlier, who just lost a bet in a flip coin game and his legendary rolled eggs. Suddenly, something fell at Roomba's feet. He picked it up, and Alfred explained it was a flip coin, a game that kept the diner busy even at night. This was why the eatery had been expanding. Roomba then remembered it was the same thing Trila had shown him. Actually, the flip coin game's rights had been sold to Trila, and the Slolet family would receive a percentage of the profits based on sales. Roomba was a bit surprised that this world had a patent system in place, but it made sense. Without it, the hardworking skilled craftsmen who created magical tools would not be recognized. Roomba, interested in the game, sat down opposite Roland to play around. Roland, up to his old tricks, offered a plate of rolled eggs as a prize to the winner. He quickly picked up a nearby plate of eggs to show Roomba. Roomba's eyes lit up at the sight of the eggs, and he promised to try a small piece before starting the game. However, small for Roomba meant finishing off the entire plate, leaving everyone sighing at the clean plate. Roland baited him further, saying if Roomba wanted more, he'd have to beat him first. The two quickly sat down to play. Syria, coming from behind, lamented that Roland was always there, and the evenings were even busier, leading to frequent brawls that she had to resolve. Or more accurately, her husband did, and if he couldn't handle the ruffians, she'd make him try harder. While talking, Syria dragged Alfred to help her with the dishes, and he reluctantly agreed. Seeing this, Roomba quietly asked Roland if the boy was always so dull, recalling how Alfred made a similar mistake when fighting with Nord. 
Roland seriously replied that initially everyone thought the same, but the rolled eggs, the square pan used to make them, the spaghetti, and the flip coin game were all Alfred's ideas. Truly, the line between stupidity and genius is as thin as paper. The two continued their conversation, discussing the oddities of Coliad Village and occasionally ordering more drinks, while young Master Alfred was busy washing dishes. Today, Alfred and Roomba set out to hunt. They agreed not to invite Eleonora, with Roomba instructing Alfred to be mindful of their path and reduce noise as much as possible. Alfred agreed, eager to learn more adventurous skills from Roomba, so they ventured deeper into the forest. Roomba moved stealthily, avoiding unnecessary movements. Suddenly, they heard a noise. A rabbit, followed by a wild boar, appeared. Roomba, with a light step and a stone in hand, threw it accurately, hitting the boar on the head. Alfred, hiding behind a rock, admired Roomba's skill. Suddenly, Roomba gestured for Alfred to stop, sensing a monster approaching, possibly a goblin. Alfred turned pale. The presence of a goblin meant it had separated from its pack. Although the forest around the mansion was generally safe, deeper into the woods, adventurers could encounter various monsters and their habitats. The Lord's duty is to protect the people from rampant monsters and bandits. Behind them, a rustling sound emerged, and an unfamiliar figure appeared. Alfred had seen this creature in books. It was a goblin. The two hid behind bushes. This wasn't the first time Alfred had seen a monster. He had previously encountered a spirit wolf, freezing in place upon making eye contact. However, Nord and the border guards had tamed it. Roomba turned to Alfred, asking if he wanted to fight the goblin with a sword. Alfred was horrified. Did Roomba not realize he was just a six-year-old child, or had he forgotten Alfred's sword-fighting incident? The goblin, sensing their presence, glared menacingly. Roomba drew his sword to confront it. Alfred, realizing it was going to be a close combat with the monster, quickly used a teleportation spell to escape. Roomba, not seeing Alfred, was surprised and turned around, spotting him behind a large tree, and ran towards him. With no other choice, as the goblin approached, Alfred summoned his strength and used a powerful magic spell. Roomba quickly ducked behind a tree. As the goblin appeared, wind blades sliced through the air. Alfred shouted Ballista instantly, the goblin's arm was severed, an ice spear piercing through its body, and purple blood spilled as it collapsed. The Lord's duty is to protect the people from their fears, and at least for now, Alfred had done his part. No matter the world, the value of life is the most incomprehensible thing. The two turned their backs on the goblin's body and moved forward. Roomba was puzzled by Alfred's strength. Alfred smiled, pleased with using magic to enrich his daily life. In Alfred's kitchen, wearing an apron, he was cooking, with Bartolo standing beside him, eyeing him suspiciously. Finally, the dish was ready. Meatballs. Bartolo rolled up his sleeves to help, and they worked together seamlessly. Alfred used his legendary technique, tossing two meatballs between his hands ten times. Bartolo gaped in amazement, a technique typically seen among mothers. Alfred explained that this method released trapped air inside the meatballs, ensuring they wouldn't fall apart when cooked. Plus, the final product looked very appealing. Alfred was lost in thought, imagining if he ever got married, he would want his wife to wear a beautiful apron and make this dish for him reminding him of his high school days in his previous life. He advised Bartolo to make a dimple in the middle of each meatball because as they cook, they tend to expand, making it hard for heat to reach the center. The dimple would allow the heat to penetrate more easily. Bartolo followed Alfred's instruction, added some water, and covered the pan. When the center of the meatballs turned dark and hot, they were done. The delicious aroma spread in all directions, and the two quickly plated the meatballs and added some sauce. Alfred tasted one, it was quite good and tender. He turned and noticed Mina peeking from behind the door, wondering how long she had been there. She stood outside, panting and sweating, listening to their conversation about possibly adding cheese, onions and mushrooms to the meatballs. It would be wonderful. Bartolo asked what to do with the leftovers, suggesting they ask someone else to taste them and leave Mina to it. Overjoyed, Mina quickly grabbed the plate, but just as she was about to eat, Eleonora appeared, attracted by the smell, and in a moment, the meatball in front of Mina disappeared, leaving her in tears. 
Eleonora had taken the new dish to try with her mother. Bartolo consoled Mina, promising to make another portion for her. She happily agreed, deciding to wait, but before she could, another maid called her back to finish her chores. Alfred and Bartolo reassured Mina that they would make a new portion for her. However, in the end, she never got to taste the meatballs because Eleonora and her mother came asking for more. They silently apologized to Mina in their hearts. The weather was turning into summer, becoming hotter. Roomba and Alfred were wiping sweat, admiring the summer and how the wheat fields changed from vibrant green to golden yellow, a beautiful sight. The sound of a horse-drawn carriage approached, and Trila arrived with a beaming face to greet them. Alfred and Barbaros frowned in displeasure, realizing Trila was the one who had tipped off the maids about the hidden sugar jars. He was a sharp-minded merchant, more perceptive than most, yet he failed to recognize the mistake he had caused. This certainly made him a true fool. However, since he was a guest, Alfred invited Trila into the house for a chat. Thanks to Alfred's flip coin game, Trila had opened a second store in the royal capital, generating significant sales that also benefited the Slowlit family. Although Alfred didn't know the exact amount his family had earned, judging by the amount of salt and sugar stored in the village and the mansion, it must be substantial. Trila had strong business acumen and was the sole provider of livestock like chickens and cows to the locals. Alfred suspected that Trila was profiting from this as well, and despite his untrustworthy appearance, everything seemed to be going according to his plan. They were set for a long-term partnership. However, Alfred couldn't forgive Trila for his betrayal during their last encounter. He would have to pay for all the suffering Alfred and Barbaros endured over those seven days. Lost in thought, Alfred was brought back to reality when Trila suddenly stood up asking to use the bath after his long journey. Alfred agreed to let him use it. Trila's eyes sparkled. In this world, without the presence of hotels, finding accommodation in a village was easy, but accessing a bath was another story. For someone like Alfred, originally from Japan and raised in a modern environment, the long travels of the locals seemed quite harsh. He showed Trila the way to the bathroom. Then Trila suddenly remembered something and turned to Alfred asking about the thing he wanted him to find out about last time they met. It was about rice. Hearing the word rice, Alfred eagerly pressed Trila for every detail, certain that Trila had some amount of rice with him. Rice was the sole food of Japanese cuisine, and even before finding rice, Alfred had been searching for similar ingredients in this world. On average, a Japanese person consumes about one bag of rice per year if they eat rice every day. That's around 60 kilograms of rice. However, that's an earthling calculation. For a six-year-old child like Alfred, it's not surprising to consume 80 kilograms of rice in a year. But he should probably start with 40 kilograms. Alfred thinks, obviously, he should start farming his own rice field. That way, he can eat as much as he likes. He's calculating in his head how much rice can be grown in one hectare, or what can be harvested from a tenth of a hectare. Meanwhile, Trila looks pale, sitting on the floor. He gently calls out to Alfred, who turns around, his face still dreamy with excitement at the mention of rice. He asks Trila how much rice he has brought maybe about a ton. Trila laughs awkwardly, how could I bring that much? Only 100 kilograms. Alfred scratches his head in dismay. 100 kilograms is hardly enough to last him two years. Trila immediately reassures the young master, Alfred Sam, calm down. If I find more, you'll be the first to touch them." Alfred's expression changes, his eyes sparkling as he looks at Trila. How fortunate to have a soulmate like you. Rice is the bond of our friendship. At least now Alfred no longer finds Trila irritating. He quickly leads the way to the bathroom for Trila, promising to make him a meatball hamburger later. Trila suddenly remembers something. He pulls a large, palm-sized candy from his pocket and gives it to Alfred. This is a new product, it's really tasty, and it even helps to relieve fatigue Alfred thanks Trila, and just like that, Trila transforms from a betrayer to a vital ally. Alfred wonders how he'll explain this to Uncle Barbaros. Well, for the sake of the village's culinary heritage, I will protect Trila. Maid Meaner runs up from behind, having just had a discussion with Trila about Alfred keeping some sugar on him. Alfred, scratching his hair, lies that he gave away the last candy, so it's all gone. 
Hearing this, Mina immediately turns to report this to Eleonora. Alfred internally panics, grabbing Mina's hand and giving her three candies. Suspicious, Mina tells him to jump a bit. Reluctantly, Alfred does so, and the sound of candies clinking in his pocket betrays him, forcing him to hand them all over to Mina. She unwraps one and pops it into her mouth. Alfred's eyes widen in anger, this is no different than being robbed. No one here witnessed the crime of Mina, and that Trila with his irksome ways that just can't be fixed. Alfred quickly went to find Barbaros. Barbaros had just found some Akala berries and planned to mix a bit into a hamburger for that Trila to try. Since Akala is very spicy, he had to be careful with the dosage, not to overdo it. Alfred, full of fervor, insisted that a little wouldn't be enough, not even one berry, because of that wretched Trila, the new candy they had just created was discovered and completely stolen by Mina. It was all his fault for being too careless. At first, Barbaros was surprised, but then his anger flared up. He dumped all the Akala berries he had found into the ground meat, deciding the hamburger should be a hundred times spicier to make him taste the flavor of hell. In the room, the atmosphere was tense. Eleonora peeked in, smelling something delicious. After finishing her sword training, she was famished and wanted some of the hamburger. Seeing a finished piece behind, Alfred, distracted, just wanted his sister to eat quickly and leave. He told Eleonora to eat it, as it was a token of his affection. Sensing something was amiss, Alfred and Bartolo turned around, but it was too late. Eleonora had already taken a big bite. Instantly, she felt as if her mouth could breathe fire, grabbing a cup of water nearby to gulp down, glaring at the two with resentment. Alfred tried to explain, but to no avail. Eleonora approached him, saying he should taste his own affection. The remaining piece was shoved into Alfred's mouth, the fiery taste of a kala spreading inside, his complexion turning pale, his eyes spinning. He then fainted, overwhelmed by the burning sensation. Meanwhile, the Trila was enjoying regular dishes instead of this hellish one. But it didn't matter, Alfred thought to himself, there would be time for revenge. Staggering, he went to the well to wash his face. Having practiced swordsmanship from early morning until noon, splashing water on his face felt refreshing. Maid Sarah, coming from behind, handed him a towel. He took it, thanking her softly. Sarah had been taking care of Alfred since he was a baby, probably around 22 years old now. Her jet black hair was rare in this world. Being of Japanese descent himself, it wasn't unusual, but still, it carried a sense of nostalgia. Seeing her son staring at Sarah, Mrs. Elna suddenly exclaimed, Do you like Sarah? Alfred immediately denied it, saying he just liked her black hair. The boy went outside, deciding to take a small trip as the weather was nice. He went to the kitchen to get the earthenware rice pot he had asked Logan to make a few days ago. With this pot, he could make delicious rice, looking at the fluffy, shiny grains in front of him made Alfred feel satisfied. After the rice was cooked, he lowered the heat of the stove and let the rice cool down a bit before shaping it into balls, wrapping them in leaves and storing them in his storage space. In this storage space, where the laws of time didn't apply, Alfred could enjoy his hot origini rice balls anytime. To thank Logan for making the pot that helped realize his dream, Alfred decided to share some of the rice balls with him. He was sure Logan would be amazed and irresistibly drawn to the dish. Alfred, carrying the rice box wrapped in cloth, thought there was nothing better than eating rice balls with rolled eggs. Even without miso soup, it wasn't too disappointing. Right, he should look for some miso paste, but was it even available in this world? If there's rice, there must be soybeans. Now, Alfred's task was to turn every stone to find soybeans. Suddenly, from a distance, he heard cheering. It was Eleonora fencing, and the crowd was enthusiastically supporting her. Seeing Eleonora and then looking at the rice box in his hand, Alfred quickly ran away before being discovered. Arriving at Logan's house, he knocked on the door. Logan came out, and Alfred proudly showed the rice box, explaining it was made from the pot he gave him last week. Logan was surprised, wondering if the boy had come all this way just to bring this to him. He took it and said he'd eat it later. Alfred's face fell in despair. Logan would eat his freshly made warm rice balls later. He needed a good reason to convince Logan to eat them now. Alfred asked if Logan wanted to go camping with him, but Logan declined and shut the door in his face. 
Inside the house, Logan, feeling hungry, decided to try a rice ball. Moments later, he flung the door open, asking Alfred if this dish would be on Syria's restaurant menu. Alfred replied that he only had a little rice left at the mansion, so Syria's restaurant couldn't serve this dish. Logan suggested that the rice balls should be eaten with some rolled eggs and urged Alfred to quickly create a dish with rice so he could enjoy it. Alfred was pleased, knowing a food connoisseur like Logan would definitely appreciate the combination of rice balls and rolled eggs. After saying goodbye, Alfred, on his way home, thought about going camping. But realizing he'd be alone, he hesitated about asking Logan again. He wished he had friends his age to enjoy fun times together. Then he thought of asking his brother Silvio. Ahead, Eleonora appeared with two girls. She introduced them to Alfred as her brother, while the two girls were Emma and Sheila. Both seemed friendly towards Alfred, but what caught his attention was Emma's bust, the embodiment of every man's dreams and hopes. He quickly shook his head to compose himself. Emma asked about his plans for the day, and Alfred mentioned he was thinking of going to the mountains, finding a spot, and having lunch there. Eventually, all three agreed to go camping on the mountain, and Eleonora decided to join for fun. Since the weather was beautiful, Alfred, Eleonora, Emma, and Sheila set off for the camping trip. Realizing no one had packed food for the day, Eleonora told her friends she would ask Uncle Bartolo to prepare some food. Her friends joyfully agreed, while Alfred marveled at how the person with such an elegant demeanor could be the same terror at home. After getting the food Bartolo prepared, the four quickly set off. Noticing Alfred seemed a bit tired, Emma approached and held his hand, creating a rosy scene. Perhaps disapproving, Eleonora told Emma that Alfred had been training in swordsmanship for a while, and this small slope was nothing for him. Hearing this, Emma immediately let go, leaving Alfred feeling helpless with his sister's intervention. He sighed to himself, noting how soft Emma's hand was, very different from his calloused hands from sword training. But she must have thought he was uncomfortable with the calluses from his training. Sheila mentioned that all three had been training in swordsmanship for about two years and had joined a defensive military training program. Emma greatly admired Eleonora, especially how she dedicated herself to the duel. As they walked and talked, they finally reached their destination. From the high vantage point, they could overlook the entire countryside and even see the Slowlit family's mansion. Then, the four of them sat down on a grassy mat to have lunch. Opening the lunchbox, they found the dishes Bartolo had made. Emma asked Eleonora what the white thing in the lunchbox was. Eleonora didn't know, as it was her first time seeing it, and turned to ask Alfred. He explained it was rice balls, which taste better when eaten with meat. Everyone tried them and praised the dish. Emma commented on the sticky texture and the subtle sweetness that emerged with each chew. Eleonora agreed, but Alfred knew she didn't really understand. After lunch, Eleonora and Alfred lay down on the grass mat, looking up at the tree canopy. Alfred sighed contentedly, this is truly a heavenly life. A satisfying lunch, a peaceful view, and the freedom to do whatever I like. A bird flew out from the tree, making a strange sound. Alfred asked Eleonora what species it was. It turned out to be a funi bird, native to high mountain region. But what was more interesting was that, despite being a bird, funis could run on the ground and often tripped over themselves. What a weird bird, Alfred thought. He curiously asked Eleonora how long she planned to keep up her refined manner of speaking. Eleonora, with a dark smile, leaned closer and whispered, for your safety, I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Every girl has her secret. As Alfred tried to slip away, she grabbed his collar and pulled him back. Emma and Sheila, watching the siblings play from above, laughed admiringly. Emma knew Eleonora always kept an eye on her brother when climbing to ensure his safety. The only person who was stern with him was also the one who cared for him the most. Though she often used a harsh and cold tone, compared to previous times, Alfred could still feel the tenderness and care in her words. After all, they were siblings, weren't they? The wheat harvest season had just begun, but the village of Colliet was already bustling and lively. Despite being busy for hours with the wheat harvest and other fruits, it was also a time for family members to come together and work alongside each other. At the village eatery, Alfred chatted with Syria and her daughter. 
There was talk of organizing a Go tournament this year, and as the creator of the game, Alfred was certain to attend. The eatery was bustling with more customers than usual. Back at the Slowlit Mansion, Bartolo and the maids were overwhelmed with work, not only ensuring food for everyone in the village, but also for visiting guests. Bartolo was frustrated, vowing not to take on the cooking responsibilities next year. Lying in his room, Alfred was aware of the commotion outside. On such a cold day, he just wanted to stay in his room with a little fire for warmth. Suddenly, Eleonora burst into the room, urging Alfred to get up for sword practice. He refused, not just because Eleonora had entered without knocking, but also because it was too cold to go outside. Eleonora excitedly argued that without diligent practice, he would never improve, and mockingly threatened to reshape his face if he didn't stop sulking. Left with no choice, Alfred agreed. Eleonora then left, mentioning that Silvio had already started without him. Outside, Alfred shivered in the cold weather. He saw the two in short sleeves and shorts, freezing cold, like children pretending to be strong in winter with just a short-sleeved shirt. He had never seen anything like it, and thought he'd rather meow a few times in protest. It was expected of Eleonora, but even Silvio. Mr. Nord appeared, greeting his children good morning. He wanted to start the morning with a run around the mansion. While running, seeing Eleonora and Alfred constantly bickering, Silvio suggested they settle their dispute with a sword duel. Eleonora quickly agreed, and after completing the run, they stood before their father. Next was the sword practice session. It had been five months since Alfred first held a wooden sword. Nord commented that Alfred's arms still lacked strength, advising him to use his whole body's weight to swing the sword. Meanwhile, Silvio's movements were clear and meticulous. Though not naturally gifted in swordsmanship, he always thought thoroughly before acting, frequently asking his father about the theories of sword fighting. On the other hand, Eleonora tended to focus more on practical training. For instance, wooden swords aren't very sharp, but a single swing from Eleonora can result in four cuts. Next was the one-on-one -on -one duel, starting with Alfred and Silvio. The duel began with Alfred immediately striking towards Silvio, and they both swiftly engaged. Far away, Eleonora and Mr. Nord were also preparing to fight, seemingly channeling magic into their swords. Eleonora could use fire magic, but she had yet to master this special skill. To confront enemies like Gubin or Wurf, she needed to reach the realm of casting three fireballs. A mage's magic increases after depleting and fully recovering their mana. Alfred always reminded Eleonora of this, wondering if she kept it in mind. Nord could control wind magic, a fight Alfred preferred to stay out of. The lesson ended without a clear winner, as if the outcome was understood by all. The three siblings then returned to their rooms to bathe. Alfred thought to himself as he stood before the bathtub. Previously, water was boiled using magical tools. Now, using his own magic was much faster. He had concocted a plan to prank Silvio. The first step was to fill Silvio's bathtub with bone-chillingly cold water, then call him to bathe. Alfred imagined Silvio shivering in the icy water, a revenge for suggesting a sword duel during the lesson. Suddenly, a scream rang out. Alfred recognized the voice and peered out, seeing the devilish Eleonora in a bathrobe charging towards him, which almost made him faint in fear. He quickly shut the door, his hands shaking, sweating coldly in the midst of winter. Eleonora had used the bathtub he prepared. Alfred hypnotized himself to not hear her footsteps anymore, thinking just one more second, and he would be safe. But in that very second, the door slowly opened, revealing Eleonora's menacing face. A piercing scream echoed throughout the mansion, marking the end of Alfred's life. Today, the Slowlets had invited Trila over to make shopping more convenient. With Mr. Nord and Silvio busy preparing for the upcoming Harvest Festival, and Alfred not wanting to join Eleonora's hellish training session, he suggested getting some new clothes. Therefore, Trila was invited over, even though it was Alfred who initially refused the idea. Eleonora stood before the weapon chests, her eyes sparkling. Brother Trila led Alfred to the men's clothing section. Recently, there's been a fashion trend of decorated collars, but Alfred wasn't fond of it. He was more interested in a stylish cloak and scarf. Eleonora quickly dismissed his choice, saying it didn't suit him. Mrs. Elna explained that it wasn't about the cost or fit, 
but such garments were only for those of a certain rank in the nobility. The reason Trila displayed such out-of-rank clothing was Mrs. Elna's affection for Alfred, to broaden his knowledge of various garments and accessories, it was touchingly considerate. Alfred moved to some clothes that seemed more fitting, hesitating over whether to try a fur coat. Mrs. Elna said it looked a bit plain, but still urged him to try it on. Eleonora, meanwhile, was examining swords. She disliked the trend of jeweling them, preferring a sharp blade. Mrs. Elna scolded her for not showing more feminine behavior. But that was just not Eleonora's way. Alfred, in the changing room, felt quite satisfied with his choice. Although it wasn't like Silvio's clothing, it was comfortable and easy to move in, and the color was appealing. Stepping out from behind the curtain, the trio outside was stunned. The outfit suited Alfred perfectly, despite its simplicity. Brother Trila thought no ordinary person could look as good in it as Alfred did. While Alfred had found his perfect outfit, Eleonora was still indecisive. Mrs. Elna insisted she try on another dress. Eleonora was beautiful, but her fashion sense was rather unique. She stepped out in a lovely dress, but with a sword strapped to her waist. Mrs. Elna immediately sent her back to try something more feminine. Eleonora exploded in frustration, arguing that trying on all these clothes would take all afternoon. Hearing this, Alfred felt a surge of joy inside. No more sword training for the afternoon. He quickly handed his mother several dresses, claiming they would suit his sister well. Mrs. Elna agreed and urged Eleonora to try on a particular dress. Reluctantly, to avoid wasting more time, Eleonora agreed. Thirty minutes later, Eleonora emerged in a dress that looked stunning on her. It was exactly what Mrs. Elna had hoped for, but she still wanted her daughter to try one more. Eleonora quickly headed back to the changing room. Forty minutes later, Alfred thought that the time spent trying on clothes was getting a bit long, perhaps shortening the sword training wouldn't be so bad. Eleonora then stepped out again, her ponytail now loose over her shoulders, wearing a flowing floor-length dress that looked elegant yet haughty. Surprised by her different look, Alfred blurted out, Who is this brat? The gentle girl in front of him immediately changed her expression and yelled at him. Alfred turned pale with fear, certain this was a disguise, this couldn't be his sister. Meanwhile, Mrs. Elna smiled delightedly at Eleonora's new appearance. Eleonora asked her mother if she could change back now, feeling very uncomfortable. After getting her mother's approval, she dashed behind the curtain, quickly changing out of the dress and tying her hair back, ignoring the maid's advice. Regular clothes were still the best, she thought, quickly grabbing Alfred to resume sword training. Alfred secretly thought that though her dress appearance looked very elegant and all, her usual enthusiastic and energetic demeanor wasn't bad either. After all, Eleonora was a beautiful girl, wasn't she? Yesterday, Mr. Nord and Silvio were patrolling around the village. Along the way, they met some kind-hearted villagers who were preparing for the upcoming harvest festival and were more than willing to share their produce with the father and son. Mr. Nord remarked that this was how the people of Colliet village showed they were living well and had great affection for the Slolet family. Eventually, the bounty they received from the villagers filled their storeroom to the brim. Alfred, peeking in, spotted some large, plump sweet potatoes. He wanted to roast them, but without the right seasoning, their natural sweetness would be lost. Alfred prepared a large, empty jar that just needed a quick rinse before use. He had to move it bit by bit, ensuring no one saw it. While busily using magic, Alfred suddenly heard Eleonora's call. Startled, he looked around but saw no one. It turned out she was studying with Brother Silvio in Mr. Nord's study. Eleonora was sure she had heard the crispy footsteps of her younger brother. Silvio quickly went to the window, looked down, and upon seeing Alfred, believed his sister's words. Alfred felt helpless against Eleonora's intuition. She asked him what he was up to. Alfred replied that he was just looking for something interesting to play with in the storeroom. He needed a somewhat believable excuse, so he could roast the potatoes without being disturbed, a blend of truth and deception. After escaping Eleonora with Silvio's help, Alfred quickly set about his plan. First, he washed the jar, then filled it with charcoal and secured a string to hang the potatoes. He placed a small metal ring to hold the potatoes in place, then created a charcoal furnace below. Finally, he used fire magic to ignite the charcoal and covered his mouth. 
Now, all he had to do was wait about 30-40 minutes for the potatoes to cook. Meanwhile, he decided to practice some magic fire, water, earth. With magic, anything was possible. Alfred never got bored of magic, just like Eleonora never tired of her sword. Time passed quickly, like a sunbeam in a dream. In this world, people didn't need clocks, they relied on the sound of bells. Alfred had grown accustomed to this. He opened the lid of the jar and was greeted by an intoxicating aroma, sweet like honey, with not a single potato burnt. He teleported a potato to his hand, but as soon as it touched his skin, he reflexively threw it away it was still hot. Waiting for it to cool down a bit, Alfred peeled off the skin and took a bite of the sweet potato. It was exceptionally sweet, a natural sweetness distinct from sugar, unique to sweet potatoes. The potato was perfectly cooked, soft but not mushy, melting delightfully in his mouth. This way of roasting sweet potatoes was indeed marvelous. Alfred sat under a tree with a contentedly full belly. Suddenly, the Nord family, Eleonora and Silvio appeared behind him. Silvio, curious about Alfred's jar, asked if it wasn't the same jar that Countess Yelena had given to their father. Alfred panicked such an important item, used just for roasting sweet potatoes in the storeroom. It was a gift from a countess, no less. He worried about the consequences for his family. While Alfred was lost in his anxious thoughts, Eleonora and Silvio dived into the jar to try the potatoes, praising their deliciousness. Mr. Nord decided to deal with Alfred after enjoying the potatoes himself. Alfred probably wouldn't face any serious trouble. After all, who doesn't love roasted sweet potatoes? The Harvest Festival was a time everyone looked forward to, a day when people could sit back and relax, free from thoughts of work. There would be eating, dancing and celebrating the year's bountiful harvest. A poor harvest would mean a smaller celebration. Thanks to the money made from flipping coins and other small ventures, this year's festival was grand. Uncle Bartolo was incredibly busy preparing food for the large-scale event, and no matter how much was prepared, it seemed never enough. This year, even a baron and a marquess were expected to attend. Hearing about the marquess, Alfred flinched, recalling the jar he used to roast the potatoes, a gifted item. After calming himself, he headed to where people were gathering to play chess. The festival day was bustling, with people from all around coming to the village. Alfred saw some faces he had never seen before in the lively, united crowd. At Syria's eatery, where the chess competition was held, Alfred squeezed through the crowd, spotting Roland and Syria. Due to the overcrowding, he asked Syria's permission to move some tables and chairs outside, with Roland lending a hand. Alfred used his teleportation magic, drawing admiring and surprised looks from the onlooker. Roland and his friend Wester were heatedly discussing magic, almost coming to blows, when the surrounding crowd quickly started betting on who would win. As the tension escalated, Syria, from behind, loudly scolded everyone to be quiet and suggested settling their dispute over a game of chess instead. Lying on the ground, Roland and Wester found this a reasonable solution and promptly got up to take their places at the chess table. Alfred, having created the game, was automatically advanced to the next round. It would be odd for him to be eliminated in the preliminary. He was particularly looking forward to his next match against Carla, who had vowed to beat him next time. After Roland and Wester's match and an additional round, both were defeated by two men Alfred had never met before. The squint-eyed man won against Wester, and the blonde-haired man triumphed over Roland. Alfred knew he had to be cautious facing these unfamiliar opponents. Herman, holding the tournament results, walked past Alfred and showed him his next opponent, the man who had beaten Roland, currently enjoying a plate of rolled omelets. The man, having eaten a significant amount, pulled out gold coins to pay for his meal, which surprised Alfred. Few villagers had gold coins. Could this man be an adventurer like Roomba? Alfred wondered, finding him suspicious. The man, noticing Herman the referee asked if his next opponent was going to be a kid. Herman confirmed, saying the match was about to start. The man, named Melnar, greeted Alfred, and they both sat down for their game. This was set to be the most anticipated match of the day. At Syria's eatery, the chess match between Lord Slowlet's second son and the mysterious man named Melnar was about to begin. The outcome was as expected by many. Alfred won decisively and moved on to the third round. 
Melnar, aware that the game's creator would have an advantage, was not disappointed by his loss. He was from elsewhere, but the game of chess had captivated him here. Despite losing to a youngster, which would typically lead to disappointment or annoyance, Melnar seemed quite at ease. Alfred thought he and Roomba would get along well. A brown-haired man approached Alfred to greet him. He was Yulina. Although the name sounded familiar to Alfred, he couldn't recall when they had met before. Maintaining his excellent form, Alfred advanced to the finals, defeating all his opponents along the way. His final adversary was Yulina, who had beaten Carla. Yulina, a brown-haired man, had earlier greeted Alfred, a name familiar to him, though he couldn't recall where they had met. The betting was split between Alfred and Yulina, leading to a playful argument between Carla and Roland. As referee Herman announced the start of the match, Yulina played white and Alfred black. This was sure to be a tense battle of wits between two formidable opponents. The game saw many strategic moves and deep thinking, with spectators on both sides trying to predict each player's moves. Yulina seemed to have the advantage in terms of more pieces, but Alfred had his own tactic. He limited Yulina's placement option, forcing him to play in a square diagonal pattern from the corners, a strategy Alfred termed X, making it difficult for Yulina to reclaim key position. Yulina chuckled ruefully as he realized his important positions were compromised. Seeing Roland's confusion, Carla quickly explained the situation to him. The final game concluded with Alfred emerging as the champion. He and Yulina shook hands after the match, acknowledging that Yulina's thought process was superior to others present. Yulina's moves were well calculated and considered all possible responses. However, he still lacked experience and could become as strong an opponent as Silvio. In the celebratory atmosphere Melnar, holding a bag of money, invited Alfred and Yulina to sit down for a meal, ordering three bottles of wine, fruit juice, and spaghetti. The trio toasted to Alfred's victory. Yulina was surprised to learn that Alfred was only six years old, saying that today they should drink to their heart's content. In a burst of excitement, Alfred stood up to perform a magic trick on stage. He would enter a magic box he had created using earth magic and escape without breaking it in under 10 seconds. Everyone was amazed by this unique magic performance. Alfred stepped into the magic box while the crowd outside started counting. As the count reached 10, there was a loud explosion, and a blinding flash of light forced everyone to shield their eyes. The box shattered to pieces. People were worried about Alfred, but he calmly appeared behind them, leaving them astounded and confused. In truth, while everyone was busy counting, Alfred had teleported to the kitchen, then used earth magic to break the box before reappearing in the room. He bowed to thank everyone for watching. Everyone was eager for Alfred to reveal how he escaped, but of course he refused, as revealing the secret would spoil the magic. While sitting and drinking, both Yulina and Melnar were surprised to see Alfred use ice magic, a skill reminiscent of the ice princess from the capital. Alfred found the name unfamiliar. In fact, this ice princess was the third princess of the Misfield Kingdom. Common folk like them had to address her with a flowery nickname, while those close to her called her the Ice Doll. She was named so because Layla, the princess, was born with a disability in her legs. When people learned of her inability to walk, they started to distance themselves from her. However, their attitudes changed for the better when Layla began to use ice magic. This hypocritical behavior made Layla lose trust in everyone, even her own family. Alfred, engrossed in the story, suddenly stopped, wondering how Yulina knew so much about royal affairs. It turned out that neither Yulina nor Melnar were ordinary people. Melnar was a baron, and Yulina a count. Alfred was shocked, realizing Yulina was the one who gifted the jar to his family. He recalled something Bartolo had mentioned in a previous meeting. Yulina also guessed that Alfred was the second son of the Slolit family. Both had to leave, expecting that Yulina's wife would have arrived at the Slolit mansion by now. At the Slolit estate, a carriage bearing the eagle emblem of the Yulina family stopped at the gate. This emblem was traditionally granted to Yulina's uncle upon inheriting the title from the palace. The larger carriage in front belonged to Baron Melnar, marked with a sword emblem. Yet, both were fascinated by the Slolit family's emblem, a dragon. 
Though Mr. Nord was embarrassed by his nickname, Dragon Slayer, the dragon emblem was indeed very impressive. Learning about Nord's nickname, both Yulina and Melnar couldn't help but laugh heartily. As the three of them were shedding tears, Nord, with a stern face, walked out. Yulina and Melnar quickly introduced themselves. Despite being in casual clothes, they exuded an aristocratic demeanor. Alfred invited them into the house, simultaneously welcoming the two guests and sweating over being caught speaking ill of his father. Nord led the way to a room and gently knocked. Inside was Yulina's wife, and upon meeting, they embraced each other like two lovebirds. The lady, named Linaria, was quite petite, making Alfred suspect Yulina of bullying kids. She swiftly introduced herself as Yulina's wife, and Melnar also introduced himself to her. Learning that Alfred was the second son of a general, Linaria expressed her gratitude for his hospitality. Alfred thought to himself that surely his smile must have left Linaria awestruck. Not wanting to stay and chat with these boring people, Alfred headed to his room, surprised to find Linaria following him. He was taken aback when she expressed a desire to talk to him, feeling as if someone was deliberately trying to touch his head. Thanks to Eleonora, he was always sensitive to his surroundings. As he was lost in thought, Linaria sneaked closer to Alfred and gently touched his head, startling him, while she blushed with embarrassment. She confessed that she found Alfred adorable and liked children, explaining that as the youngest in her family, she always longed for a younger brother. Alfred completely understood this feeling. Back in Japan, he had three older sisters and had experienced all kinds of misery, even in this life, unable to escape Eleonora's clutches. If he had a younger brother, he would have used him as a shield against her. Sighing, Alfred admitted he too wished for a younger brother. Catching on to Alfred's wavelength, Linaria asked if he would like to become her son. Alfred's eyes widened in shock. The lowly girl in front of him was saying something outrageous. After hearing Linaria's question about becoming her child, Alfred was astonished. He just wanted a younger brother. Standing in the cold hallway, he invited Linaria into his room and used fire magic to warm it up. She was impressed with Alfred's adept use of magic, while she only knew a bit of wind magic. Linaria inquired if Alfred had ever practiced intermediate level earth magic, like attack magic similar to cutting wind. Since attack magic was rare and usually required going out of town, Alfred had never seen it, although daily magic could be used for attack if one knew how to utilize it. In this world, people don't think magic can aid in everyday life. If only they were more open and accepting, magic could make their lives much more wondrous. Moreover, magic can also help escape dangers. For Alfred, it helps protect himself from his nemesis Eleonora. Linaria, standing in front of a fascinating chessboard, mentioned the game had spread to the capital. She had even persuaded her father, Duke Lovladi, to play, and it seemed he quite enjoyed it. Alfred's face turned pale upon hearing Duke, that was a position of high stature. Only those without royal lineage, but with significant influence were bestowed the title of Duke. In other words, it represented the pinnacle of nobility. Eleonora burst into the room, not bothering to knock, startling both occupants. Linaria was frozen in shock. After being overpowered by his sister, Alfred turned back to Linaria, asking how she and Yulina had met. Blushing, Linaria said it was love at first sight. Both siblings' eyes sparkled with curiosity. The story dated back seven years. Alfred, amazed, asked Linaria's age, she was just 16 now. That meant she fell for Yulina at first sight when she was just nine. Discussing such an age seemed a bit odd. They then inquired at what age she got married. Initially, her father disagreed, but after years of persuasion, he changed his mind, and finally, she received his blessing. Their love blossomed into reality after seven years. Eleonora's eyes gleamed with admiration for this pure love, sounding like a fairy tale. Alfred shattered her delicate thoughts, saying Eleonora lacked subtlety and gentleness, such dreams wouldn't even occur in her sleep. Ignoring his sister's anger, he continued, Nisan, the power of a maiden is something every girl should possess, derived from their virtuous qualities to affirm their existence. In other words, it's the strength of a lady, far different from your blatant power, Eleonora San enraged, Eleonora clenched her fist and thumped it down on Alfred's head. Alfred, in pain and teary-eyed, glared at his assailant. 
Meanwhile, Linaria chuckled, watching the close bond between the siblings. Yulina entered, calling her wife to return home. The couple left cheerfully. The slow-lit siblings remained in their room, faces grim, continuing their sibling squabble. In Alfred Slowlit's bedroom, he was indecisively pondering whether to get out of his warm bed to go to the bathroom or to stay snug under the covers. But he couldn't hold it any longer. He had to go, as he couldn't sleep well if he kept holding it in, even if it meant risking sleeplessness afterwards. Yet he wondered, would his blanket feel abandoned if he left it? No, he decided, despite the arduous journey to the bathroom, he was determined to go forward. Alfred planned to teleport to the bathroom and then comfortably relieve himself. Suddenly, he opened his eyes, realizing it was all a dream. But wait, had he wet the bed? No, thankfully not his little brother was still safe. He decided to snooze a bit more. Silvio was about to knock on the door from outside when big sister Eleonora burst in like a whirlwind. Alfred pretended to be asleep, not acknowledging any noise. Eleonora, knowing her brother was faking it, flipped the blanket, playfully smacked his face, and ended with a punch to his forehead. Reluctantly, Alfred opened his eyes, wincing in pain. Eleonora urged him to get up for sword practice, as Nord had decided he would train with Yulina or Roomba. Both of them expected him personally. Getting out of bed, Silvio advised him to prepare well. Then, the three of them went for breakfast. In the dining room, Mrs. Nord was sitting at the table and burst into a smile upon seeing Alfred, as did the maids Sarah and Mina, laughing until tears flowed. Alfred rushed to look in the mirror and saw five red handprints from Eleonora starkly imprinted on his forehead. Embarrassed and angry, he wondered why everyone chose to laugh instead of telling him. He swore that today he would exert all his strength to make Eleonora pay. Just you wait, Demon Queen Eleonora fuming, he finished breakfast and headed out for a sword fight with Eleonora. Upon arrival he showed his angry face and yelled, There you are, Demon Queen, I will make you kneel and apologize to me. Seeing Eleonora's changing expression, he quickly bowed his head, admitting his mistake for being late. Internally fretting, just one glare had him shaking like a leaf, was he just a pet in his past life and this one too? Seeing her dumbfounded brother standing there, Eleonora quickly called him to start warming up. Roomba and Count Melnar also came out. As soon as Alfred appeared, Nord immediately wanted to duel with him. Alfred refused, suspecting Roomba would go all out against his opponent, possibly flinging him far with a swing of his sword. Seeing this, Melnar suggested they duel each other. Alfred waved off the idea. He knew both Nord and Melnar were equally combative. It would be foolish to engage in a sword fight with Since neither could duel with a young boy, the two ended up arguing amongst themselves, leaving Eleonora to drag Alfred away for more warm-up. Today, Silvio seemed particularly serious about the training session, as if he was intent on defeating a rival. No doubt, both Silvio and Alfred shared a common enemy. If both attacked with full force, even if it was Eleonora, they might stand a chance of winning. Just wait, Demon Queen Eleonora San. After everyone finished warming up, Nord gathered everyone and announced a round-robin-style tournament. This would also test if Alfred could withstand a sword strike from Count Melnar. In the first round, Alfred faced Silvio, both quickly taking their position. Roomba and Melnar couldn't predict the winner. Alfred leaned more towards magic than swordsmanship, and with Silvio being older, he had a better chance of winning. The match began, and Silvio swung his sword towards Alfred, who immediately noticed Silvio's sword force was different from usual. However, considering the frequency of their swings, their sword skills were about equal. Seeing Alfred's expression, Silvio bit his lip, thinking Alfred was underestimating him. He struck a powerful blow, forcing Alfred to step back. Then came a series of continuous strikes, but thanks to his sister's frequent outbursts, Alfred had reached a level where he could anticipate the sword's path. After a while, both returned to their original positions, facing each other, visibly exhausted. Just as Silvio was about to deliver the final blow, Nord declared the match over. This fight was just to measure their strength, so hitting the opponent wasn't necessary. Hearing this, Alfred collapsed to the ground, clutching his sword. He couldn't take it anymore. 
Today, Silvio was truly impressive, probably not wanting to lose to his younger brother, he had exerted himself greatly. After warning his son Alfred not to use magic in the duel, Nord announced the next match would be between Eleonora and Alfred. Without a chance to rest and recover, Alfred's face darkened. Eleonora cheerfully asked if he was ready, but her friendly face couldn't hide her eagerness for battle. Alfred internally felt a surge of fear, yet the brave hero Alfred stood up to fight the demon queen Eleonora, despite everyone knowing his chances of winning were zero. The match began but ended in mere seconds to everyone's surprise. Alfred lay on the ground, defeated by Eleonora's first move. Afterwards, Eleonora and Silvio sat under a tree, with Eleonora having tried to be as gentle as possible, not even breaking a sweat. Meanwhile, Count Melnar was helping Alfred train, who quickly realized his shortcomings. Just as he was about to continue, Roomba eagerly stepped in to duel with him. Alfred, trembling, barely managed to defend himself, not even having the time to wipe his sweat away. Roomba's powerful moves sent chills down Alfred's spine, seemingly intent on finishing him off. Melnar, observing from a side, commented to Nord that Alfred was quite suited for adventurous escapades, given his remarkable resilience. The next day, Uncle Bartolo found Alfred shakily leaning against a wall, taking small steps. It was the last day of the festival, with guests dwindling and Count Melnar preparing to leave. Yulina and Linaria also came to thank everyone and bid farewell, likely to meet again at a royal banquet. After saying goodbye, Alfred went up to the town to enjoy the last day of the Harvest Festival. Silvio joined him, even though he had planned to spend the day reading in his room. Alfred didn't realize that Silvio too was fond of stories and eagerly awaited the next plot twist. Alfred thought he resembled his father Nord while he himself took after his mother, but maybe not he wasn't as kind-hearted or gullible as Elma. Since it was the festival's last day, the evening was packed for the bonfire night. During this event, everyone would gather to sing and dance, a time for communal feasting and merriment, and the food for the feast was provided free of charge by the Slolet family. This year's event was bigger than the last, sponsored by the merchant Trila. Mentioning Trila made Alfred angry, as it was because of him that he and Barbaros had suffered so much. Alfred wondered how much he had lost because of Trila, Seeing Alfred grinding his teeth, Silvio quickly calmed his brother down. Realizing it was a day for joy, not for cursing Trila, they decided to let go of their anger and headed to buy fruit juice from a stall. Alfred and Silvio hadn't been out long before they got separated. Alfred overheard passers-by mentioning a cute blonde boy holding hands with a shorter boy and thought they might be talking about him and Silvio, but he ignored it and continued browsing the stalls. After sampling nearly all the foods, he planned to head to the western stalls. On his way, he met the village head who told him about an arm wrestling tournament at the square, and Alfred immediately ran to watch. He was greeted by the sight of a man with solid abs, trying to look cool it was Roland, with his opponent Wester further away. Normally, Wester looked slender in clothes, who knew he'd look like this shirtless. The crowd cheered for the two main characters of the tournament, which seemed particularly popular with women, creating many fangirls with just a handshake. Wester and Roland grabbed each other's hands, waiting for the referee's start signal. As the cheers erupted again, Alfred quickly left the chaotic scene. Wondering what to do next, he suddenly saw a familiar figure it was Emma. But she disappeared in a flash, and following her, Alfred found Emma talking to a boy. Anger surged in him, blurting out, who's that brat? To his surprise, the boy retorted, and who's this runt? Emma quickly scolded the stranger and introduced Alfred as the Lord's son, then turned to him and said the boy was her younger brother. The boy introduced himself as Thor, eight years old. They shook hands, and Thor found out Alfred had an older sister named Eleonora. Thor, blushing and hesitating in a corner, finally dared to ask if Eleonora was engaged. Alfred was struck dumb by the question, unable to deny Eleonora's beauty and well-toned body from training. Still, he was determined not to let her deceive Thor and plan to reveal Eleonora's true nature to him. Contrary to Alfred, Thor thought he liked Eleonora because of her kind face and radiant smile. Alfred immediately pointed at Thor, accusing him of judging by appearances. He was convinced Thor's brain had issues to think that way, comparing Eleonora, who was different from the beautiful and kind-hearted Emma-san. 
Thor yelled back, arguing that Alfred clearly didn't realize his sister was an uncaring, lazy, messy person, and even accused her of stuffing her chest. While the two were fervently arguing, they didn't notice the looming danger behind them. Eleonora and Emma appeared like vengeful deities, with deadly smiles on their lips. The boys, their faces ashen, were looking for an escape when Silvio arrived to greet everyone. Eleonora grabbed Alfred by the collar and dragged him away, while Emma firmly held on to Thor, and they bid each other farewell. The uncertain future of the two boys had officially begun, and there was nothing left to do but accept their fate. After being captured, Alfred's punishment was to be tickle tortured. The damage was zero, but the humiliation was 1,000. After wallowing in misery for a while, Alfred decided to head to the campfire area. Thor was already waiting there, and they quickly reunited. They became friends after sharing about their crushes. Thor was eager to know more about Eleonora, pestering Alfred to tell him if she was engaged. Although Eleonora didn't have a fiancé, she had several suitors in the past. Two years ago, a nobleman had a crush on her. But after he made his intentions known, Eleonora drew her sword and threatened him. Since then, no one dared to invite her to parties or express any interest in her. Eleonora was indeed very strong, and Thor would have no chance if he couldn't match her strength. The two sat on a log, sharing their thoughts. Thor smiled confidently. He might not match Eleonora in swordsmanship, but he wouldn't give up. He was determined to become a true man who others could rely on. A week after the harvest festival, to counter the cold outside, Alfred lay indoors with fire magic and a hot cup of tea. Magic was truly wonderful. When spring came, he could lie on the grass all day, using spatial magic to summon prepared food whenever he was hungry. That was the life reclining and reading books like a nobleman. A voice from outside startled him, causing him to fall backward onto the floor. He pretended to be deaf and covered his ears, but the voice outside grew louder. Thor was shouting for Alfred, who finally couldn't take it anymore and opened the window. Thor, standing below, yelled up that he had decided to become an adventurer. Adventurers are people who dedicate their entire lives to fulfilling the quests of their clients. No matter the request, whether it's to hunt demons or serve as a bodyguard for a noble merchant, they would take on the task. Sometimes, they might be asked to find rare treasures or precious minerals. Other times, their quest could involve searching for exquisite ingredients and gathering information about rare items found only in certain areas. In this world, every man dreams of being an adventurer at least once. But Alfred was different. He never aspired to fit that mold. He simply wanted to observe this world, living the peaceful days he couldn't experience in his past life. So when Thor asked if he wanted to join him, Alfred declined, preferring a tranquil life in the village. Thor seemed to understand Alfred's intent and invited him over to his house. Upon learning that Emma was also there, Alfred sped off like the wind. As he opened the door, a loud thump echoed, and Eleonora's figure sprawled on the floor. The young boy's face was a picture of confusion. Seeing Eleonora unconscious, Alfred rushed over, debating whether to bury her or just leave her there. Checking her pulse and breath, he realized she was still alive. Perhaps it was the door that took the hit. He glanced up, relieved that the door was intact. He hesitated, unsure whether to deliver a decisive blow to his sister. Eventually, Eleonora would wake up hungry, and he'd surely become her target. Or maybe he should quietly carry her to bed, letting her believe it was all a dream. Just as he was about to use teleportation magic on Eleonora, he noticed the maid Mina standing there. After much contemplation, he decided to bribe her with candy. Though she didn't jump for joy as usual, Alfred filled Mina's pockets with sweets and asked her to take his sister back to her room. Then, he hurried off to meet Thor at the gate, oblivious to Mina's distant gaze and menacing smile behind him. Alfred was still daydreaming about Emma's house, both envious and excited about living with their respective crushes. Finally, they arrived. In front of them were two houses with orange roofs, Thor's having a darker shade due to recent repainting. Next door was Sheila's house. Thor peeked inside and then burst in with a shout, realizing that it was Alfred's friend visiting today, not a smoke. The siblings frantically began cleaning up the house, removing dresses from the stove and underwear from the floor. Outside, Alfred forced a smile, secretly thinking that inside must be Thor's mother. 
and Emma was probably in the basement, immersing herself in nature with a cup of tea and playing with the little birds. After Emma and Thor finished cleaning, they invited Alfred in. Entering, he saw Emma with a friendly smile standing there. Alfred blushed shyly, and she brought him some water to drink. Noticing the clothes she was wearing, he asked if she often did housework. Emma didn't deny it, explaining that her parents were working far away. Thor was shocked and his eyes widened, but the murderous look and painful kick from his sister rendered him speechless. Emma left, giving the brothers some privacy. Thor then talked to Alfred about his decision to become an adventurer, asking what preparations were needed since Alfred's father Nord was also an adventurer and might know more. To become an adventurer, one must register at the guild at the age of 12. That meant Thor had to wait four more years. Alfred suggested that in the meantime, Thor should train his physical strength or learn swordsmanship from Emma and Eleonora. He also told Thor that an adventurer needs to be literate. Although literacy rates in this world are low and not being able to read is common, especially in remote villages without schools, an adventurer needs not only strength but also knowledge and the ability to calculate prices. Thor was shocked as if struck by lightning wondering who could teach him to read and write since Emma also didn't know. Thor hugged Alfred tightly. Alfred, with no other choice, agreed to teach Thor, leaving him tearfully overjoyed. After a tiring day out, Alfred dragged his weary feet home. The gate was already open, and there stood Eleonora with a sword in her hand, smiling brightly, asking where he had been. Alfred froze, urging himself to stay calm, and told her he had been at Thor's house. She mentioned that she had fainted today and asked if he knew why. Alfred prayed internally, hoping Eleonora wouldn't remember anything, and that Mina wouldn't add more to the story. Eleonora turned her hellish gaze towards him, indicating that Mina had already spilled everything. Now it was the young boy's turn to faint. The next day, Eleonora brought a bowl to Alfred's room, asking him to fetch some hot water for her to wash her face. Seeing his sister, Alfred involuntarily remembered the previous night's events, where he ran for his life while Eleonora chased him with a sword. Using magic to enhance her speed, she quickly caught up to him, forcing Alfred to use earth magic to create steps leading up into the sky to escape. Back to reality Eleonora, not wanting to wait for water to be heated, brought a basin to Alfred. Knowing her temperament, Alfred provocatively suggested she didn't know how to heat water. Sure enough, she took the bait. Eleonora led him outside, instructing him to form a hovering water orb, then she raised her hands and chanted a spell to command a small flame to burn everything. A large ring of fire encircled her, approaching the water orb and boiling it. She pulled Alfred to test the water's temperature, which he obviously refused, not wanting to get burnt. Alfred pointed to a pile of wood across them, asking her to try burning it. Eleonora searched herself for something flammable and found a letter, which she deemed unimportant and tossed into the woodpile. She repeated the spell from earlier, this time trying to control the flame's intensity with more care. However, the fire became even larger than before, quickly blackening the woodpile. Alfred, feeling helpless, teleported a piece of wood and demonstrated to Eleonora. A tiny flame danced on Alfred's hand, slowly growing larger. Eleonora followed suit, her flame changing shape according to Alfred's instruction. Sweat dripped down her face as she maintained a steady flow of magic for a minute. Alfred, playing with the fire, counted time for her. After a minute, an exhausted Eleonora collapsed on the grass. Alfred urged her to try again, and this time she managed to control the smaller flame better. Eleonora continued her spell, moving the tiny flame towards the woodpile where it finally caught fire. She joyfully hugged Alfred, as this was the first time she had successfully controlled fire. Seeing his sister's happy face, Alfred found her endearing but quickly dismissed the thought. Eleonora continued practicing her magic, now able to adjust the size and temperature of the flame as she wished. It was a peaceful moment before the storm arrived. While Alfred was looking out the window, he noticed Eleonora's room door was open. Peeking in, he saw her getting ready in front of the mirror, gently patting her stomach. Alfred stood behind, his words escaping faster than his thoughts, almost saying, are you getting fat? When suddenly a slipper flew into his face, knocking him down to the floor. Eleonora stood before him, demanding an explanation. He immediately denied it. 
Picking up the slipper, he remembered gifting it to Eleonora. Actually, in this world, slippers didn't exist until he created them. Both his mother and sister loved wearing them. They were a luxury reserved for guests at the manor. But he hadn't seen Eleonora pick up the slipper. Yet a second later, his cheek stung from the impact. The speed was unbelievable. As Eleonora raised the slipper again, Alfred quickly tried to make peace, clarifying he was actually talking about her shirt, not her weight. He teased how every winter Eleonora seemed to gain a few pounds like animals storing fat for the cold season, but her body arms, legs, waist, chest was all very slender. Weight. Chest. Realizing his mistake, Alfred immediately turned to run, with Eleonora quickly chasing after him. Seeing the siblings chasing each other in the hallway, Mr. Nord expressed his disapproval. Alfred internally apologized to his father. If he stopped to get caught, it would be more dangerous than running in the hallway. Alfred continued to run ahead. Despite having experience with slippers from his previous life, he couldn't shake off Eleonora who was hot on his heels. He ran into his room and locked the door. While Eleonora went to get the key, Alfred needed a way to escape. He took out a rope from his space and left it outside the window, trying to mislead Eleonora into thinking he had escaped outside. Meanwhile, Eleonora opened the door with the key, but the room was empty. Alfred had teleported himself to Barbaros's location, but it wasn't long before she appeared in the kitchen, asking Barbaros if he had seen Alfred. After getting rid of Eleonora, Alfred continued to look for a hiding place. Passing by the maid's room, he heard them discussing his and Eleonora's chase, realizing she might be outside, he slowed his pace and went upstairs. Unexpectedly, Eleonora came in from outside, greeting him out of habit, and Alfred, also out of habit, greeted back. Realizing each other's presence, the chase resumed. Running up the stairs, he bumped into Silvio, and they both fell, with Silvio knocked unconscious. Alfred muttered in dismay and turned to continue running. Suddenly, Mr. Nord appeared in front of them, stopping both Alfred and Eleonora in their tracks. While being lectured by his father, Alfred could only pay attention to the slippers Mr. Nord was wearing. Indeed, it suits the nickname Dragon Slayer well. Alfred asked his father how he felt wearing them. Nord thanked his son, saying the slippers were very comfortable. However, in the end, both Alfred and Eleonora were scolded, and it seemed Eleonora's training session was harder than usual. Today was the day Alfred was to teach Thor how to read. Reading and calculating are essential skills for an adventurer. Yet, not long into the lesson, Thor grew disheartened and rested his head down. Alfred's teaching intensity was high, so Thor suggested they take a break to get water and fruit. Thor went inside to get the fruit while Alfred sat outside, muttering that fruit juice should have a drop of white water as a gift for the teacher who took the trouble to teach. Alfred spent time teaching Thor because they were friends. He needed to learn to read to understand client requests and calculate to avoid troubles with rewards. Even if not becoming an adventurer, these skills could help become a merchant. Alfred hoped Thor understood that. 30 minutes later, during their math lesson, Thor's face became expressionless, his eyes spinning. Hearing from Alfred that the lesson was over, Thor suddenly became alert, completing his exercises with a clear mind. Just as he was about to leave, Alfred called him back to check the answers. Finally, with much effort, Thor scored five points. He quickly pulled Alfred to practice swordsmanship. Thor believed Alfred must be strong, having been taught by a lord, and wanted him to display all his skills. Facing those sparkling eyes full of dreams of becoming an adventurer, Alfred couldn't refuse, considering it child's play. Thor, holding a stick, charged towards Alfred, who quickly raised a piece of wood to block. They engaged in a fight, and soon Thor was cornered against a tree and admitted defeat. But he wanted to fight again with a new weapon. Thor ran to find another branch while Alfred used a whip. After a few moves, Thor sat down defeated, looking up at Alfred with hopeful eyes, asking to be taught. Alfred agreed, and they resumed fighting. Practice seemed to be the best approach to swordsmanship. The sounds of the whip cracking and Thor's cries of pain echoed through the forest. Today, a heavy snowfall covered the entire manor. Bartolo stood on the roof, shoveling snow down to the ground. Alfred, at a distance, rolled a snowball and aimed precisely, hitting Barbaros on the buttocks. Barbaros was startled and turned around, only to realize it was just Alfred's prank. 
Barbaros quickly made a large snowball with his hands. Alfred's smile froze. How could he make such a big snowball? He started running, but fortunately, the snowball didn't hit him and rolled towards a tree instead. Exhausted from this pointless game, Alfred saw two people approaching the gate. One was Thor, and the other was an unfamiliar man. Thor introduced him as a Smo, Sheila's younger brother and his neighbor. They greeted each other, and Alfred, in his usual playful manner, poked a Smo's belly, making Thor laugh until he cried. Talking and walking, they left the gate and saw a large group gathered, seemingly playing a snowball fight. Roland's team and Wester's team were enthusiastically competing, while the three boys found it uninteresting. They quickly found a new game, sculpting snow. While Thor and Asmo rolled snowballs, Alfred was more delicate, positioning each snow block precisely. Soon, a giant snowman was formed, astonishing Thor and Asmo. Thor challenged Alfred to create human figures, and he agreed. Next, three snow sisters appeared before them. Thor wanted to take the snow Eleonora home. They went to a frozen lake, and Alfred brought out ice skates for everyone. Unlike Asmo and Alfred, Thor struggled with the skates and fell several times. Seeing Thor hesitant to try, Asmo pushed him, causing Thor to fall face first into the snow. Angrily, Thor started fighting with Asmo right on the ice. But as they got carried away, the ice cracked, revealing the cold water beneath. Both immediately stopped moving, afraid to cause further damage. Alfred from the shore thought of ways to rescue the troublesome duo. But with time running out and the ice cracking more, Alfred only managed to pull a smo into the air. Thor, unfortunately, fell into the water. Despite being warmed up by Alfred's hot water, Thor couldn't stop shivering. As the three stood together, they saw Eleonora, Emma, and Sheila approaching. Eleonora pointed at the three snow figures and asked if they made them. Thor admitted they did, but upon closer inspection, someone had altered the figures without them noticing. The bust of Eleonora was exaggeratedly enlarged, and the arms of Emma and Sheila were depicted with strong muscles. Alfred immediately denied having anything to do with Eleonora's enhanced chest, but before he could finish, a snowball flew towards them. In a similar situation to Alfred, the other two boys were also being disciplined by their sisters. All three boys continuously denied randomly adding to the snow figures. Their sisters, not believing them, kept throwing snowballs in revenge. Unable to tolerate it any longer, Alfred, Thor, and Asmo gathered to form an alliance, deciding that today was the day the younger brothers would prove they were stronger than their elder sisters. The brothers' union and sisters' union were quickly established, promising a grand battle ahead. After forming their team, the boys advanced. Eleonora's snowball flew past Alfred's face and lodged deep into a wall. Alfred immediately erected ice walls for defense. Spectators gathered around to watch the battle, placing bets on who would win. Hindered by the ice wall in front, Eleonora circled around to sneak attack from behind. Alfred smiled dangerously, knowing she had fallen into his trap. He had secretly created pits behind to trap her, knowing she would try to approach. Eleonora indeed fell into one. Seizing the opportunity, Alfred, Thor, and Asmo coordinated an attack on the remaining two. Eleonora, emerging from the pit, her hand still smoldering with a bit of flame, fell into another pit before she could attack Alfred. Before Alfred could rejoice, Eleonora climbed out again. He threw a series of snowballs at her, and upon discovering that Alfred's snowballs contained hidden rocks, Eleonora, enraged, dodged and pursued him. Onlookers admired her beauty, her red hair flying amidst the white snow, but to Alfred, it was like being chased by a demon. She chanted a spell, summoning a large flame that melted the surrounding snow. Alfred, unable to create an ice wall, led the other two in a retreat. Thor tripped and fell onto sharp ice spikes on the ground, and Emma appeared with a menacing smile. Recognizing his friend in danger, Alfred directed Asmo to ram into the house, causing large snow blocks on the roof to collapse onto Thor and Emma. Apologizing softly, Alfred wondered if Sheila might also have been buried under the snow. Lost in thought, Alfred was startled when Eleonora appeared before him. He quickly teleported to the rooftop, where a gigantic snowball made earlier by Thor and Asmo was located. He pushed it towards Eleonora, who of course dodged it. Alfred then made the snowball explode, sending a barrage of smaller snowballs towards his sister. 
but as they neared Eleonora, they melted into water. Eleonora, using the snow fragments, created a platform to elevate herself towards Alfred. He tried to escape by creating ice blocks in mid-air, but Eleonora was right behind him. She plunged her sword deep into an ice block, hanging precariously in the air. Determined not to let Alfred escape this time, they both hung suspended. Realizing his sister hadn't grasped the danger, Alfred warned he would go down first. Eleonora, in a panic, begged to follow, reluctantly apologizing for not trusting her brother and conceding the battle, acknowledging Alfred as the victor. It was the first time Alfred had ever won against Eleonora. Outside, as the snow fluttered down, Alfred relaxed beside a fire when Eleonora asked him to make tea. All the servants, including Barbaros, had the day off, and even he was out drinking at Syria's tavern. After Mrs. Elna entered, everyone sat down, leaving tea making duties to Alfred. Mrs. Elna inquired if the water for the tea was magically conjured. Alfred admitted it wasn't, as natural water always tasted better than magically created water. Learning that Nord used to be an adventurer and Elna cooked without magic, the Slowlit children were surprised. Nord added that Elna was also skilled in sewing and suggested she make beef stew since Bartolo was not home. With doubtful eyes, everyone watched as Elna stood up with Eleonora to prepare the meal, Eleonora following reluctantly. After a while, a plate of beef stew, indistinguishable from normal stew, complete with spaghetti and vegetables chopped by Eleonora, was placed before each person. Nord, Silvio and Alfred tasted it and found it delicious. Elner revealed the spaghetti was made by Eleonora, to everyone's astonishment. Alfred couldn't believe his sister could season so well. Eleonora's face showed she just followed her mother's instructions for spices, simply seasoning by instinct after all the ingredients were added. Hearing about cooking based on instinct, the three people sitting and enjoying their meal went pale, hoping Barbaros would return soon and wishing for a peaceful night ahead. The next morning, relieved to find himself alive, Alfred had plans for the day. He decided to make a kotatsu, a type of Japanese heated table. He already had a table that, when covered with a blanket, would resemble a kotatsu. However, the challenge was how to heat it from inside. Alfred brainstormed various ideas to no avail and decided to visit the library. His plan was to find a magical tool, write a ritual, and infuse power into an object, certain that some magical tool could be used for the kotatsu. After searching the entire bookshelf without success, he went to consult Mr. Nord, who informed him that to find a magic book, one must go to the Royal Capitals Academy. But that place was far from here, and contacting the Trila Trade Guild was not an option since they had just arrived and wouldn't return anytime soon. Waiting until spring would make the kotatsu unnecessary. Mrs. Elna showed her son a letter, revealing that Mr. Nord had been invited to a royal banquet for the new year, and Alfred was also on the guest list. Sensing their son's intention to escape, the parents firmly held his shoulders. Alfred was obliged to attend this party as it was a coming-of-age celebration, primarily to introduce the next heirs of the nobility, fostering relationships or marriage prospects. Eleonora and Silvio had attended before, but marriage talks always led to complications. Mr. Nord, a former commoner turned noble through his achievements as an adventurer, wasn't keen on attending, as the hereditary nobles didn't favor him much. But this time, both parents agreed Alfred must attend this spring feast. The heart of the Misfrit Kingdom, also a leading city in the world ruled by the royal family, was a melting pot of nobles, traders, adventurers and commoners. There, Alfred was sure to find many useful items he needed. Going to the capital had its benefits. Although he couldn't make a kotatsu now, Alfred was determined to see the rumored play about the dragon slaying hero once he arrived. As winter turned to spring, it was time for the royal banquet in the capital. Mr. and Mrs. Slowlit, along with Alfred, quietly left the village in a carriage. Traveling from Koliat in the east of the Misfrit Kingdom would take about a week by carriage, not accounting for any troubles on the road. As they continued their journey, accompanying them were Roomba and Gast, a hired mercenary. While Alfred was chatting merrily with the two, Gast caught a strange scent the smell of a demonic beat. Suddenly, two goobins emerged from the bushes, charging towards them. After instructing everyone to return to the carriage, the two guards engaged in combat. 
It didn't take long for the Goobins to be defeated, with Gast lying on the ground satisfied while Roomba collected the spoils of battle. The group resumed their journey, and finally after seven days they reached the capital. Passersby recognizing the Slolet family's dragon crest knew the carriage's occupants were from the dragon-slaying family. Mr. Nord presented their family crest to the guards to verify their identity and purpose of visit. The guard, curious about Alfred's and Nord's age, and even Nord's taste in men, made the father and son sweat. After inspecting the carriage's cargo, they were allowed to enter the capital. Mina and Alfred, fascinated by the bustling streets, glued their faces to the carriage window, watching the crowd. The carriage stopped in front of a grand house, the Royal Hotel in the capital, complete with guards. Alfred and Mina were allowed to explore the city. They walked the streets and soon found themselves in a street food stall. The owner served them two skewers of washy meat, a kind of ferocious beast resembling a cow, common in the capital. Though they knew demonic beasts were edible, they were surprised by the delicious and rich flavor. After enjoying a few more skewers, they moved to a fruit juice stand, drinking and resting. While sipping their drinks, a cute little girl appeared before Alfred and Mina. They introduced themselves. The girl, named Ra-Chan, kept calling Alfred Al, making him blush. Watching Ra-Chan hop around, Alfred felt a stirring in his heart, perhaps this was what having a little sister felt like, all worries seemingly flying away. With sparkling eyes, Mina gave Ra-Chan some cookies. Realizing that eating too many cookies would make one thirsty, they returned to the earlier juice stand to get drinks for the little girl. Alfred wondered if he could make this green-colored drink back in his village. He asked why Ra-Chan was there. It turned out she was searching for her lost elder sister, who was seven years old, had long, smooth hair just like Ra Chan, about as tall as Alfred, and was wearing a blue uniform from the Magic Academy. Alfred and Mina remembered seeing some people in blue cloaks earlier, possibly including Ra Chan's sister. The trio stood up, determined to search the streets for her sister. But just a moment later, both Mina and Ra Chan, their eyes glittering, were waiting for food in front of a street food stall. Alfred also joined the queue, and while waiting, decided to perform a bit of magic for Ra Chan. He borrowed Mina's last cookie, placed it on his hand, and announced that the cookie would disappear after he shook his hand three times. Both were skeptical, but Alfred, with a calm expression, made the cookie disappear and then pointed to a nearby man, telling him to check his pocket, where the cookie was indeed found. As Alfred continued with more magic tricks, the crowd around them grew larger. Alfred showed everyone that his pockets were empty, then reached in and pulled out more cookies. The crowd cheered and clapped loudly. While Ra Chan was asking how he did it, the stall owner announced that the beef stew was ready, and the three quickly entered the stall. The surrounding crowd still wanted to see more, and Alfred thought that performing magic here could attract even more people, including possibly Ra Chan's sister. But first, they needed to eat. The owner of the stall offered them the meal for free, grateful for the crowd Alfred had drawn. After finishing their meal, Alfred resumed his magic show, and indeed, the crowd grew. Suddenly, a carriage stopped in front of the crowd, and a girl on it spotted Ra Chan. The girl jumped down from the carriage, and Ra Chan ran towards her. Mina and Alfred were happy for the little girl. Ra Chan's sister was indeed beautiful, but Alfred wondered wasn't 12 the minimum age to enroll in the Magic Academy, and when would he finally stop performing magic? On their fourth day in the capital, Elna suggested visiting her parents. Shortly after, the three arrived at Mr. Lazareth and Mrs. Elena's house. Mrs. Elena complimented Alfred on his unusual yet beautiful eyes. The men went inside to talk, while the women sat outside, admiring the view. Mr. Lazareth chided Nord for not bringing the kids over more often, expressing how long it had been since he had last seen Eleonora and Silvio. Nord spoke softly, apologizing for the distance from Coliat village to the capital, making visits challenging. He further discussed with his father-in-law, or rather, Papa, that Nord's domain was a peaceful place that didn't attract much attention, hence not requiring close ties with higher-ups. Mr. Lazarus agreed, but noted that Alfred had recently drawn considerable attention from the nobles with his board game. 
Everyone complained about not having enough pieces to play, and even Mr. Lazarus proudly showed off the prototypes that his grandson had given him around the city. The conversation then shifted to Eleonora, who was soon to join the Knights Guild and would be staying at their house. Nord chuckled, breaking Lazarus' illusion, explaining an unwritten rule that knights must stay in the dormitory during training, though they do get some days off to visit family. This left Lazarus' face crestfallen. Alfred quickly grasped the main point. His bothersome cousin would join the Knights Guild, meaning she would be busy and no longer disturb his peaceful life. From now on, he decided to treat Eleonora kindly, planning a heartfelt farewell on the day she leaves. On the fourth and fifth days, the Slowlet family stayed at their grandparents' house. The sixth day, which was also Alfred's birthday, was the day they had to attend the royal banquet. Elna instructed Alfred to properly greet the host, Duke Leon Grand. Alfred thought his parents were over-worrying but had his plan. Step 1, arrive at the venue. Step 2, divert attention to his parents. Step 3, secretly leave the venue while everyone is distracted. Step 4, enjoy the feast like a regular person. The family quickly got ready to leave. Standing in front of Duke Grand's grand house, Alfred's eyes widened in awe. The three of them entered, joined by Roomba. Elna commented that Duke Leon Grand was renowned for his noble spirit, as evidenced by the armor displays around. She explained that Leon Grand was the type who always strikes first, needing to attack before the enemy gets a chance to retaliate, even if the enemy has no intention of attacking. This was his combat style. Alfred secretly thought this man was bizarre and dangerously unpredictable. As they reached the center of the party, the dazzling lights of the venue nearly blinded Alfred as all eyes turned towards the three of them. Suddenly, Count Caber appeared, greeting Nord and expressing surprise to see the Slowlit family at such an event. Before Nord could introduce him, Alfred stepped forward and elegantly bowed, introducing himself as a gentleman. Count Caber remarked how different Alfred seemed compared to Eleonora and Silvio. This prompted whispers among the crowd, speculating that this was the youngest son of the Slowlit family and how he didn't seem as charming as Silvio. Enduring the attention, Alfred was unaware that someone was still searching for him. As the party grew more crowded, Alfred repeatedly tried to get a drink from the servers, but they refused, thinking he was too young. Indeed, he was still a child. He was tasked with mingling with many guests, struggling to remember their long names. Seeing Alfred's exhaustion, Nord suggested he go and mingle with other children his age. As soon as Alfred left, a group of girls rushed to Nord, making Alfred realize just how popular his father was, enough to visibly annoy his mother. Alfred then focused on his main task for the evening, approaching the colorful food stalls. He marveled at the delicious cuisine, praising the skills of the Baron's chef. Spotting the last piece of meat on a tray, he reached out to grab it only to find another hand with the same intention. The two boys looked at each other. The other introduced himself as Eric Silford. After learning Alfred's identity as the Baron's son, Eric disdainfully suggested Alfred withdraw his hand, deeming a Baron from the borders inferior to his own status. Alfred, meanwhile, envied Eric for his unrestricted access to exotic fruits and sashimi. The two quickly engaged in a fight, with Alfred using a flash from an iPhone to temporarily blind Eric. Just as Alfred thought he could seize the meat, Nord appeared behind him. The scuffle had attracted the attention of the surrounding guests. In the end, both boys had to apologize and were punished by being made to stand against the wall forced to reconcile. Eric's eyes were still blurry from the flash, which had been quite bright. Alfred was punished by being made to befriend Eric, while Eric's father sentenced him to an increased training regimen of fighting ten people continuously without rest at the Silford house. While they were being reprimanded, they encountered Viscount Melnar. Learning about Alfred's fight with the Silford boy over a piece of meat, he couldn't help but laugh incessantly. Embarrassed, Alfred's face turned red. Melnar introduced Alfred to Duke Vladi, Linaria's father and Viscount Yulina's husband. They got acquainted, and Linaria had apparently spoken highly of Alfred, the creator of the board game. Melnar commented that Alfred seemed like a boy who could do anything, yet appeared so innocent. Duke Vladi shared a concern with Alfred. He had many daughters who were all charming, but they kept marrying and leaving, not staying as his daughters. 
The suitors at his door were mostly middle-aged men, none suitable for his daughters. As Vladdy was complaining, his wife appeared, rescuing Alfred. It turned out Melnar had gone to find help. Alfred internally scoffed at Vladdy, who complained about middle-aged suitors for his daughters while being a nobleman with a young wife himself. Returning to the food stall after the draining conversation, Alfred found Eric waiting. To change the mood, Alfred prepared to indulge in a perfect meal. But before he could start, a voice called out from behind. It was Ra Chan and her sister running towards them. Ra Chan leaped towards Alfred upon seeing him, only to be scolded by her sister. Hearing Ra Chan calling Alfred Oni Chan, her sister realized that he was the one who had helped her find Ra Chan when she was lost. She bowed in gratitude to Alfred and asked to speak with him privately outside. Despite a bad feeling, Alfred agreed. On the balcony, after confirming that Alfred was the one who helped Ra Chan, her sister immediately yelled at him, accusing him of spoiling her. It turned out that after returning home, Ra Chan kept calling their maid a poor maid, constantly talked about how delicious the cookies were, insisting the maid do everything for cookies, and kept asking about the disappearing cookies. The reconciliation failed, and a helpless Alfred apologized. Ra Chan's sister turned away, deciding to temporarily let the matter go. As she was about to leave, she fiercely warned Alfred, Be extremely mindful of what you say to children. There's no second chance to rectify errors. Alfred felt a chill run down his spine, barely having a moment of relief when the little girl suddenly turned to introduce herself. She was Shalka Misfeed, aged seven, belonging to the esteemed Misfeed family, a prestigious lineage supporting the kingdom since its foundation. Alfred recalled the Misfeeds as authors of several magical tomes in his family's library. He introduced himself, and Shalka seemed surprisingly taken aback by his youth, but quickly composed herself and departed. Back at the party, Ra Chan hurriedly embraced Alfred, and instinctively, Shalka intervened, advising her sister against embracing strangers. Inquisitive, Ra Chan asked whom she's allowed to hug. Family and loved ones, Shalka responded. Puzzled by loved ones, the younger sister's eyes twinkled with curiosity, leading her to inquire about the term. Shalka, somewhat flustered, eventually explained that a loved one is someone you'd want to kiss Ra Chan. The little girl, thrilled, exclaimed that she had already kissed, astonishing both Alfred and her sister. She boldly claimed she had kissed Alfred. This revelation left all three, including Eric, in utter disbelief. Alfred frantically reviewed his memories, struggling to find when such a kiss with Ra Chan could have occurred, especially considering his mature spirit. In a heated exchange, Shalka cornered Alfred for an explanation, their confrontation intensifying until Ra Chan's admission sent a wave of astonishment through everyone. Alfred managed to break free from Shalka's grip, turning to face Ra Chan, with two figures, armed with cutlery, ominously standing behind him, poised to intervene. He then realized the inadvertent kiss occurred indirectly through sharing his cup. He quickly turned to clarify the misunderstanding to Shalka and Eric. Shalka immediately took to instructing her sister, while Ra Chan remained blissfully unaware of the implication. In the meantime, Eric and Alfred made a swift exit. The party buzzed with the ripples of this misunderstanding, eventually quelled by the instigator. As the celebration neared its end, the host expressed gratitude for everyone's presence. Alfred, about to depart, noticed a piercing, icy stare directed at him, but chose not to linger on it. At the royal party on the second day, although reluctant, Elna and Alfred still suppressed their urge to flee and stepped into the carriage. Lady Elna was fed up with having to always appear calm and composed. However, an event immediately caught their attention. It was rumored that today, Royal Academy students would attend, possibly including Princess Cudelia of Misfright Kingdom, whom Elma mentioned as a devoted fan of Alfred's father. Thanks to her, the Nord family didn't need to maintain ties with the higher-ups. At the Ring Grand Duke's mansion, today was even busier than yesterday, complete with guards. Nord pulled his son aside for a stern talk before officially entering the party. After greeting everyone, Alfred leaned against a wall, sipping a glass of fruit juice served by a maid. That's when he ran into Eric, who immediately invited Alfred to enjoy the food, starting with meat. Alfred declined, insisting on having vegetables too. 
Knowing no one liked vegetables, he took out his homemade mayonnaise, poured it over the veggies, and offered it to Eric. With the first bite, Eric's eyes sparkled with delight. This yellow sauce could be paired with any vegetable, even eaten plain. Seeing Alfred about to dip into the sauce, Eric snatched the bottle away, claiming it as his own. He teased Alfred about indirectly kissing him, but then quickly changed the subject to the youngest child of the Misfeed family. Alfred's fiery glare erupted as he shouted, vowing never to give Eric mayonnaise again. The two broke into a fierce fight. In the midst of the brawl, the Schalke sisters appeared, scolding the troublemakers. Eventually, both boys apologized to everyone around and made up. Ra-Chan expressed her admiration for Alfred's family, all skilled in magic, and her wish to be as cool as Eleonora Sama. Alfred knew she could use unattributed magic, light magic, and advised her to practice constantly, like lighting a room or boiling water with fire magic. He also shared with Ra-Chan some tips to impress her sister, keeping it their little secret. Seeing Shalka approaching, Alfred curiously asked how she could attend the Magic Academy at such a young age. It turned out that Shalka was a grade skipper, allowed to enroll early due to her magical talent, not to mention her father being the principal. Alfred's question was merely a diversion to distract Shalka from the secret he had shared with Ra Chan. Worried she might think he intended to enroll, Alfred quickly excused himself. Meeting up with Eric, Alfred inquired if he had ever seen the dragon slaying play. Surprised that Alfred, a boy, had never seen the play, Eric remembered it was Alfred's first time in the capital. Grateful for the mayonnaise, Eric promised to take Alfred to see the play in the central square the next day. Suddenly, the grand doors opened and all eyes turned to the newcomer. Alfred was particularly struck by her eyes, it was the Duke of Ringrand's daughter. As she moved to the center of the party, she announced that Princess Cudelia would soon arrive, urging the nobles to seize this opportunity to forge relations with the royal family. Alfred glanced at Eric, whose face was frozen, staring intently at the Duke's daughter. Waving his hand in front of Eric, Alfred snapped him back to reality. Amid their playful banter, they heard laughter from behind. The girl, who had been at a distance, was now approaching. Realizing the impending interaction, Alfred thought of escaping, but was unsuccessful. The girl, introducing herself as 12-year-old Alicia Ringand, questioned if Alfred was Eric's friend. To Alfred's surprise, Eric denied it, and the two quickly started arguing. Alicia turned to Eric, noting he didn't have a fiancé and seemed quite popular. Before Eric could thoughtlessly respond, Alfred pulled him away to lecture him on manners. Eric accused Alfred of trying to ruin his once-in-a-lifetime plan. Learning that Eric intended to propose to Alicia, Alfred reluctantly scolded him for his foolishness. Alicia clarified her intention, saying she mentioned Eric looked famous, not that she was very famous herself, which meant she wished him luck in finding a well-known fiancé. Furthermore, Alicia might not have a fiancé, but she has plenty of options. In contrast, for them as nobles, the gap between a baron and a duke is vast. This is the reality, Eric. Now is too early to be engaged, especially to someone of high status like Alicia. Eric still tried to argue with Alfred, saying if the distance is too great, he would just get closer to her and propose. Alfred sighed, surrounded by simps, first Thor, and now Eric. He couldn't deny Alicia's beauty, but she was only to be admired. Look at that smile, it's no joke. Returning to the party, Alicia found Alfred's name a bit hard to pronounce and asked if she could call him Al like others do. He agreed. Then Alicia brought up a rumor about Alfred proposing to the youngest daughter of the Misfeed family, which made him jump up in denial. But it seemed no one believed him, and Alfred resigned to silence. The doors opened again, and a dignified lady entered. It was Princess Cudelia. Everyone bowed as she walked to the center of the party and told them not to mind her and just enjoy the festivities. She then immediately ran to Nord, not wanting him to address her formally. The princess heard that Nord's territory had recently become famous. Her lady-in-waiting kept urging her to leave as many wanted to greet her. Cudelia happily leaned in and held Nord's hand. Alfred felt a jolt of electricity. He guessed this might be why his mother didn't like the princess much. He quickly left to find Eric, and they discussed the various dishes. Suddenly, someone from a distance called one of them a ugly kid. 
both heard but neither admitted it was them. As they were about to start a fight, a burly guy approached Alfred. He was Bram Baumural, the eldest son of the Baumural family. Neither Alfred nor Eric had heard of him. Alfred asked Bram what he wanted, and Bram expressed his desire to challenge Alfred. Seeing Alfred refuse the challenge, Bram became visibly annoyed, arguing that Eleonora would have accepted. But Alfred was not Eleonora, so why would this guy want to challenge him? Bram, shaking with anger, had to explain that this was his only chance. If he didn't defeat Alfred, he couldn't have a rematch. Like a light bulb moment, Alfred guessed this guy must be the one Eleonora had beaten up at a party three years ago for proposing to her. They fought, and Bram was quickly defeated. Since then, Bram had sent multiple invitations to Eleonora for a rematch, and finally, he received a reply today. Alfred recalled his sister burning a letter during a magic practice session, and this reply from Eleonora stated that Bram had to defeat Alfred to get a rematch with her. Despite Alfred's insistence that he was unrelated, the reply bore his forged signature by Eleonora and came from the Slowlit family, so he had no choice but to participate. However, the duel couldn't take place tonight in front of the princess. Alicia suggested they fight the next morning in her garden. Bram agreed to this proposal and finally left. Alfred felt resigned, realizing there was no escaping this duel. The next morning, at Alicia's garden, Bram was already there waiting. Alicia was elegantly enjoying her tea. Meanwhile, Alfred had just woken up, realizing it was almost noon. Stretching, he headed to the water pond to wait for Eric, sure that he would also be late. As expected, a hurried figure appeared shortly after Eric had encountered some troubles on his way. The two casually discussed and admired the street food as they walked. Alfred stopped, feeling like someone was watching him, but then the sensation vanished. The scene shifted to Bram, who had been waiting since morning and could no longer contain his frustration. It was already the third bell, and no one had shown up for the duel that was supposed to start in the morning. Alicia, smiling, was playing with a fidget spinner in her hand, a recent invention sold by Lazarus. Despite its simple design, it was a brilliant creation. She knew who had come up with the idea for this toy. Suddenly, a figure in a black hood leaped down. This was Alicia's subordinate, reporting Alfred's whereabouts. Hearing that Alfred seemed to have forgotten about the duel, Alicia couldn't help but laugh until she cried. Bram, furious, hurried off to find Alfred and settle the score. Alicia found Alfred fascinating, from creating dishes to the flipping board game and then the spinner. Not to mention, he had even detected her subordinate's stealth technique. This kid was truly exceptional. After a stroll, Alfred collapsed into a chair panting. Just as he was thinking of getting a vegetable drink to quench his thirst, a carriage appeared. Ra Chan stepped out and hurried over, wanting to join them on a tour of the capital. Soon, Alicia approached too. To break the tense atmosphere, Ra Chan asked about the unfortunate maid Mina. Alfred chuckled awkwardly, reminding her that the maid's name was Mina and to call her by it. But Ra Chan didn't seem to care much, and Alfred was chilled by Shalka's angry gaze. As it was getting dark, Shalka told her sister it was time to go home, but Ra Chan stubbornly refused. Shalka wouldn't allow her sister to hang out with these two, which hurt Eric's pride and made him shout back. Unexpectedly, Shalka retorted that ever since the royal party, the two boys had been inseparable, sparking rumors that their relationship was more than friendship. Realizing her slip of the tongue, she quickly covered her mouth and dragged Ra Chan home. However, Ra Chan suddenly broke free and ran off, then used wind magic, causing anything light to fly up, notably Shalka's skirt. Panicked, Shalka quickly held down her skirt and turned to the only two boys present, shouting if they saw anything. They both simultaneously denied it. Shalka asked again if they saw her blue underwear, and both blurted out that it was pink. Realizing their mistake, they silently acknowledged their blunder. Eric gestured to Alfred that they should apologize, having seen what they shouldn't have. Just as the situation was heating up, Ra Chan ran up, boasting that she had mastered the wind technique just as Alfred had taught her, revealing the secret Alfred had shared with her. Hearing this, knowing they were both doomed, Eric quickly ran off, with Alfred clinging to his hand. Suddenly, Eric stopped and pointed ahead. Their enemy was already there, the fire behind her growing larger, 
her eyes filled with rage, chanting incantations under his breath, Alfred, along with Eric, hastily ran in the opposite direction. Shalka was hot on their heels, continuing her spellcasting. Alfred raised his shield to block the fierce flames and sprinted forward. Shalka seemed to be pushing her limits. Her ability to run while casting spells was truly remarkable, befitting a student of the Magic Academy. Alfred and Eric didn't dare stop. They kept moving forward as Shalka quickly gained on. Panting heavily, Alfred and Eric led the way, while Shalka, with eyes blazing in fury, followed closely behind. Alfred recalled the foolish moment when he taught Ra-Chan a secret technique to scare her little sister, never imagining the young girl could actually pull it off. The flames chasing them intensified. Shalka analyzed Alfred's magic use. He was adept at using his shield to indefinitely block her fire while simultaneously casting enhancement spells to run and shoot magic back at her. True to his reputation as a sorcerer's progeny, Eric, running ahead, pulled Alfred into a narrow alley. The area grew less crowded as they moved on, and Eric led Alfred towards a more populated eastern area. Surrounded by women, the sight of two young men running into their midst was quite startling. Alfred quickly realized they had stumbled into a haven for Fujoshi, people with interests similar to Shalka's. No wonder Eric knew this area. They needed to leave quickly. Alfred wrenched his hand free from Eric, and they both sped away, only to be stopped by the sight of a pair of legs. Bram, sword in hand and exuding a commanding presence, confronted Alfred. Finally found you. Why are you here when you've accepted the duel? That's not very manly of you. Thought you could escape me. Come and fight me right now. Alfred agreed to fight, but on one condition. They would use magic, not wooden swords. Bram had no issue with this, and they positioned themselves for the battle. Bram swung his sword at Alfred, who agilely dodged. Suddenly, a whirlwind swirled around Alfred's head and struck Bram in the chest, sending him flying into the air and then crashing to the ground unconscious. Alfred turned back to see Shalka maintaining her stance, with everyone around watching her. Trembling, Shalka asked Alfred if she had done something wrong. Alfred didn't answer but stared intensely at Bram, lying on the ground. Then, Alfred and Eric turned around, adopting a righteous tone to lecture Shalka. They pointed out that it was she who had cast the spell towards Bram, so it was only fair that she should take responsibility for bringing him back, especially since she had a vehicle. Alfred helped Bram lean against a wall while the surrounding crowd lost interest in the unfolding drama. In front of them was the Misfeed family carriage, with Real, the Misfeed's maid, stepping down to apologize to Alfred and Eric on behalf of her mistress, before hoisting Bram onto her shoulder. Eventually, the Misfeed family departed in their carriage, with little Ra Chan leaning out of the window to wave goodbye to Alfred. As the evening set in, and the dragon-slaying play was about to start at dusk, Alfred and Eric realized they might still make it in time to watch it. Alfred pulled Eric away, insisting they not go back the way they had come. That path was too dangerous, filled with too many Fujoshi. Suddenly, everyone on the street stared at the duo, then at the picture in their hand. Realizing they were about to be recognized, Alfred quickly dragged Eric away to escape before things got worse. After evading the group of Fujoshi, Eric was surprised to find Alfred taking him upwards, which Alfred claimed was the only way to escape. Eric, kneeling fearfully on the shield, caused Alfred to reluctantly enlarge it. Standing upright, Alfred relished the strong wind and the panoramic view of the city from above. They could see the majestic royal palace in front of them. Although they were quite high, the palace still looked impressive. Alfred used magic to enhance his vision, peering deep into the palace. He saw a dignified man walking ahead with a retinue following. This must be the king. Alfred shifted his gaze to a room where a girl was looking in his direction. He waved at her, and to his surprise, she waved back, both using magic to enhance their vision and communicate. Thinking the girl might alert others to their presence, Alfred told Eric they needed to descend immediately. The girl turned to her maid, asking if it was possible for someone to walk in the sky. The two boys she saw were extraordinary, using their shields as a means of transportation through the air. 
The girl smiled faintly, but her smile soon turned to a sad droop as she reflected on her own circumstances. She is the third princess of the Misfried Kingdom, Layla, a person who, even with a protective shield, cannot step forward on her own. Turning to look outside once more, Layla realizes that the two have vanished. Alfred and Eric stand atop a roof, the young boy trembling like a leaf, clutching Alfred's hand in fear. As they hover mid-air, Alfred scouts for a landing spot, discovering that if someone touches him, they can teleport along with him a skill he previously thought was limited to himself. The duo leaves the roof, landing on the ground and entering a grand theater. This place, designed for nobility, is lavishly decorated. As they ascend to their seats in anticipation of the play, Eric explains the theater's grandeur to the curious Alfred. As soon as the character Nord appears, Alfred frowns, unimpressed with the portrayal. The narrator's voice fills the theater. The scene shifts to Nord fighting thugs, and a beautiful girl, Elna, rushes in. The audience around Alfred loudly identifies her as Elna. Alfred is stunned, is this woman his mother? Downstage, Nord and Elna lock eyes. Alfred knew his mother was an adventurer, but he never imagined she was as serious and fierce as Eleonora. The play continues. A thug makes a move towards Elna, but Nord swiftly intervenes, twisting the thug's arm before turning to Elna with a comforting smile, asking if she's alright. This marks the fateful meeting of Alfred's parents. The pair often met at the guild and eventually became the most famous adventuring duo in the capital, tackling assignments together. Their bond grew stronger until the appearance of the dragon. The audience erupts in excitement as the dragon appears on stage, astonishingly realistic. Alfred wonders at the special effects used to create such an illusion. On stage, despite Elna's objections, Nord decides to fight the dragon, embodying the true spirit of an adventurer by facing danger head-on. Elna sees a fiery determination in his eyes, her own doubts dissolving, her resolve strengthening. She decides to fight alongside Nord, knowing he would likely fail without her. Even the thug expresses a desire to join the battle. United, everyone supports each other to defeat the common enemy. Seeing a different side of his parents, Alfred is still a bit surprised. It's embarrassing to think of his grandparents in such a way. The battle with the dragon is fierce and challenging, making it the highlight of the play. Nord and Elna work seamlessly together, and when the dragon finally falls, the entire hall erupts in applause. The couple runs to each other, embracing tightly, Elna shedding tears. When they approach the king, he praises Nord's talents and asks what he wishes for. Nord turns to Elna and tells the king he wants to spend his life beside the woman he loves, enjoying a peaceful life with her in the countryside. Eventually, peace returns to the kingdom, Nord is bestowed the title of a baron and lives happily with his wife Elna. This is the story of the dragon slayer, the hero who saved the kingdom. Everyone leaves with their spirits still high, their hearts racing no matter how many times they see the play. Eric comments to Alfred that he looks nothing like the son of the Dragon Slayer, not just in appearance but also in temperament. Alfred retorts that Eric is lazy and idle, quite unlike his adventurous father. The two start a playful fight, much to the surprise of those around them. It seemed they had become close after spending the day together. Eventually, they turn their backs on each other, each going their own way. Alfred thanks the boy for taking him to the play, and they part ways to their respective homes. Upon returning home, Elma asks Alfred where he's been. He tells her about the Dragon Slayer play, surprised at how much Elna resembles Eleonora. He even mimics Elna's lines from the play, like, Nord would surely lose without me, or, I want to spend my life with the one I love. Elna, fuming, grabs her son by the hair. Another murder case is afoot tonight. The next morning, as the family sits at the breakfast table, Nord announces they will return home the following day. Alfred is overjoyed. No one really wants to stay in the capital, with its endless parties and fencing tournaments. His parents are like rare animals here, everyone wanting to invite them everywhere. Nord adds that the family will go shopping before returning home. Alfred wants to buy a magical item for Bartolo, along with souvenirs for Eleonora and Silvio. He keeps it a secret that he plans to get a special gift for Emma as thanks for taking care of him. After breakfast, the family heads out for a walk in the city. Alfred successfully distracts Elna, 
allowing her to drag Nord into a clothing store while he gains some freedom. However, his joy is short-lived as Elna drags him into a shop despite his loud protests. After trying on several outfits, Alfred is finally released, and it's Nord's turn to be the next victim. The shopkeeper is overjoyed and surprised to serve the Dragon Slayer, personally selecting clothes for the hero. Seizing the opportunity, Alfred slips away to a bookstore, picking up two books for Silvio one adventure and one mystery and one about the Dragon Slayer for himself. After stashing them in his space storage, he peeks outside to see if the clothing shopping is done, only to find Elna trying on several outfits, now her turn. Two hours later, seeing his father exhaustedly waiting on a stone bench, Alfred sighs, surrounded by many other men waiting for their wives. Finally, Elna emerges from the shop, and the family heads to a restaurant for lunch, then to a magic store. Nord wants to buy the latest fire creating magical item. When shown a set that resembles a gas stove with a pot, Alfred excitedly agrees to buy it immediately. Elna inquires if it can be used for making sweets and upon Alfred's affirmative, she pays without hesitation. After a tiring day, everyone is exhausted except Elna, with the day's purchases filling a corner of the house. Bartolo will surely have a headache with all these gifts. On their last day in the capital, everyone loads their carriage with belongings, preparing to return to Koliat. Alfred reflects on how quickly the trip to the royal capital passed, remembering every face he met. Suddenly, he realizes he forgot to greet Lord Ringrand, the host of the party, explaining why the latter looked at him so terribly. His parents quickly console him, assuring that the Count is busy and they can meet him next time, relieving Alfred. As they reach the city gate, the guards wish to check their badges and verify the faces of those in the carriage. After a thorough check by the guards, the Slowlit family is finally allowed to go. Sitting in the carriage, Alfred chats with his bodyguard Gates. Gates has seen the Dragon Slayer play many times, while Alfred is still learning about his parents' past. He knows they prefer not to talk about it. Nord is shy about his Dragon Slayer title, and Elna doesn't want people to know how differently she spoke back then. Gates shares a theory that Elna helped Nord just for a sponge cake, suggesting their whole story began with a sweet treat. In the middle of their conversation Elna, her face flushed with anger, storms in and declares she's confiscating Alfred's sweets. Dejected, Alfred hugs his knees. A week later, in Koliat village, their carriage passes through fields, greeted warmly by villagers recognizing their lord's vehicle. Alfred waves back cheerfully. From afar, Thor and Esmo run towards the carriage, asking Alfred if he has gifts for them. Alfred, caught off guard, realizes he prepared a gift for Emma, but nothing for Thor. Promising to bring Thor a gift the next day, the boys run off contentedly to play. Arriving home, everyone is waiting at the door. Alfred runs to Bartolo, eagerly remembering his cooking, and asks if he managed to get the items he requested. Alfred assures him it's in the largest box in the carriage, and Bartolo hurries to check. Seeing Silvio, Alfred comments that he looks more muscular. Silvio gently smiles, asking if Alfred thought Eleonora would train with anyone else in their father's absence. Hearing this, Alfred is terrified, hugging Silvio and crying, unable to believe Silvio trained with the Demon King for three weeks. Eleonora approaches the emotional scene, and before Alfred can mention his gift for her, she asks if he practiced anything in the capital. Admitting he did not, Eleonora immediately drags him off for sword training, welcoming him home with a smile. But to Alfred, that day felt more like Eleonora was smashing him like fruit. On his first day back home, Alfred yawns and stretches by the window, signaling the end of a long and eventful journey. Looking outside, Alfred sees Eleonora jogging, wearing the hair tie he bought her. It seems she really likes the gift. Knowing that Alfred would be visiting the village today, Uncle Bartolo has prepared lunch for him. Alfred carries a small bag to Thor's house. On seeing Alfred Thor, who is chopping wood, runs over and startles him with the sharp axe. Thor asks Alfred to place the wood on the stump for splitting. Observing Thor's need to chop twice, Alfred, eyes sparkling, wonders if he could split it in one go. Despite the danger, Thor demonstrates and Alfred mentions they've bought a new fire-making tool, so they won't need firewood anymore. Thor excitedly asks why Alfred didn't get it for him as a souvenir. 
Alfred reveals a sword from behind his back, unwrapping it from its cloth. It's a real, impressive-looking sword, not a wooden one, and Thor loves it. As they're talking Esmo appears, hearing Thor brag about his new sword. Esmo turns to Alfred, asking about his gift. Alfred tells him he's brought a special cake from the capital, a dragon sponge cake. Amid Esmo's dissatisfied look, Thor suggests they go inside to enjoy the cake with some tea. Esmo declares he'll allow Thor a sixth of the cake, leading to a playful quarrel between the two. After settling their dispute, Alfred presents the box of beautifully sparkling cakes to Esmo. Thor prepares tea while Esmo gets cups and plates, their familiarity with each other's homes evident. Thor asks Alfred to light the fire for boiling water, and impressed with his skill, inquires if Alfred plans to join the Magic Academy. Alfred quickly denies it, saying even if a school opens in the village, he won't go. He might earn a lot using magic, but he already has money from flipping flags. Alfred dreams of a life where he doesn't have to do anything. Now he only wants to make soy sauce, pondering a country far away where rice is grown and soy sauce can be made. Lost in thought, he's brought back to the present as the tea is ready. The three sit down to enjoy the royal tea, stolen by Thor from his mother. Although Alfred can't remember the tea's name, it's incredibly delicious. Esmo also praises the dragon sponge cake, its soft texture and slight fruity sourness perfectly complementing the tea, making for an unparalleled experience. As they indulge in the feast, heavy footsteps sound outside. Thor's hair stands on end as his mother's voice echoes in. She's angry about the unchopped wood pile and smells the familiar tea, guessing her son's playful laziness and unauthorized use of her tea. Just as a confrontation seems imminent, Alfred politely stands up to greet Thor's mother, announcing that Mrs. Elna has invited her and Esmo's mother to a tea party at the manor soon. He mentions gifts from the capital for everyone and the prepared desserts, eagerly awaiting their visit. After finishing his piece, he excuses himself, leaving under Thor's mother's regretful gaze. She tells him he's welcome anytime. As Alfred reaches the door, he turns to thank Thor for the delightful tea, foreseeing another world war erupting soon, possibly leaving his two friends in shambles. A peaceful day unfolds in the slow-lit household. The three siblings sit in the living room, chatting. Eleonora comments on the relief of having fewer servants than in the capital, finding the constant attention tiring. She recalls her previous visit, filled with tedious tea parties and matchmaking, while Silvio spent his time meeting nobles, never doing what he wanted. Alfred suddenly remembers the books he bought. Eleonora and Silvio eagerly urge him to fetch them. Pretending to go upstairs, Alfred retrieves the Dragon Slayer book from his space and brings it down. The cover features the main characters with the dragon monster, shocking the siblings to learn their mother once dressed as a sorceress, an image none have seen before. Eleonora exclaims no wonder their mother never joined in training, she wants to duel a sorceress. Alfred tells her that dueling a sorceress is impossible without proper magic knowledge, keeping to himself that Eleonora is very similar to Mrs. Elna. After finishing the book, all three stare at the pages, realizing it almost accurately narrates their parents' story. They notice how different their parents were back then. Suddenly, Eleonora snaps the book shut, standing up as their parents approach. She insists on hiding the book, throwing it to Alfred, who quickly teleports it onto the top shelf of the bookcase, hiding the evidence. At that moment, the parents walked in, inquiring how they looked to their children, whether their attire was appealing or not. Upon receiving their children's affirmation, Mrs. Elna turned to her husband with a smile. Had she not insisted he try on the outfit, how would they have known if it looked good? Eleonora, gazing intently at her parents, thought back to what she had seen in a book. Her mother seemed so different. Silvio remarked to Alfred that he wondered if Eleonora San would change as she grew older, considering their mother changed when she fell in love. But as for Nisan, probably not. First, she would need to learn to put down her sword. Alfred returned to the house he had created using earth magic. This was his second hideout. Creating a swing using magic, he sat enjoying the fresh breeze, finding it incredibly relaxing. He remembered the last time he sat on a swing, back when he was still a salaried worker, it was a dreadful memory he quickly dismissed from his mind. 
Eleonora appeared out of nowhere, inspecting the swing's rope typical of her brother to engage in such peculiar antics. Alfred asked her what she was doing there. It turned out, having seen her brother leave in the morning, she too had left the house and then followed Alfred's footsteps disappearing into the woods. Eleonora's curiosity was piqued, wondering how her brother had managed to get there. Alfred, sweating, realized he had used teleportation magic. He should have been more careful and quickly changed the subject. He invited her to sit on the swing. Dissatisfied with the snail's pace, Eleonora urged him to push her. Alfred, panting heavily, pushed his sister on the swing, thinking she was as heavy as a pig, but before he could utter a word, Eleonora swung her fist, landing a punch on Alfred's head, warning him not to think she didn't know what he was pondering. When the swing reached a certain height, Eleonora used her strength to jump off, landing on the ground like a professional athlete. She turned sharply, and Alfred sensed danger. Indeed, she hoisted him onto the seat and stood in the swing herself, pushing while standing. Alfred looked up in terror at the small branch bearing their weight. He screamed at Eleonora that the tree couldn't take it, as a cracking sound echoed. Eleonora, seemingly oblivious to the danger, pushed harder with her legs, while Alfred resignedly smiled, accepting his fate. Miraculously, the branch didn't break, and Eleonora seemed satisfied. But the next day, Alfred brought the broken swing chair and the snapped rope to Roomba. In Roomba's baffled gaze, Alfred gritted his teeth and lied that it broke the moment he sat on it, truly a swing's misfortune. Today, Alfred went to meet Bartolo to try out a brand new magical device for making sweets. He had promised his mother to make candy and pastries when he bought this stove, and now was the time to keep that promise. Bartolo asked what he intended to do, as he was completely unfamiliar with these pastry things. Alfred didn't have a specific plan yet, but with this device, even frying would be easier. They decided to make donuts. Bartolo looked confused, so Alfred explained. First, you fry the dough, and then sprinkle sugar on it. A simple yet delicious dish was born, although it might lead to weight gain. After understanding each other's ideas, they started baking. First, they needed oil for frying. Whether it's donuts, sada and doggy or anything similar, it's all about preparing the outer layer and adding the desired filling. Alfred further instructed Bartolo that the dough needs to be kneaded and shaped into an oval form. Now, making fire was easier. Just turn on the magic-powered oven without needing to chop wood for fire, safe and convenient, truly worth the investment. They still had some leftover bread from the morning, so Bartolo cut it into slices, then smaller pieces, and fried them before sprinkling sugar on top. The finished product was crispy fried bread, a simple yet delicious snack. Alfred and Barbaros tasted a piece indeed delicious. Bartolo suggested making another dish that could only be made with this stove to show that investing in it was the right decision. Alfred planned to make a fried dish for dinner. The kitchen was not short of carrots or vegetables, but there were only a few mushrooms left. He decided to ask Silvio to pick some more, though Bartolo doubted Silvio would agree, jesting that only men can bring happiness to each other. The two then checked the dough they had left to rise earlier. It had expanded nicely and smelled just right, promising a unique dish about to be unveiled. Alfred and Barbaros were shaping the dough when Eleonora appeared from behind, drawn by the sweet smell she noticed while talking to Mrs. Nord. Alfred internally panicked her sense of smell was too keen. He had only fried some bread with sugar. Eleonora tasted a piece of the pastry and was surprised by its interesting flavor, reminiscent of a snack. Noticing she had no intention of leaving, Alfred asked if she didn't plan to share with their mother. Suddenly remembering, Eleonora quickly grabbed the plate of pastries and ran off. Alfred and Bartolo breathed a sigh of relief, feeling like their hearts were about to stop in her presence. They continued their baking, and at that moment, Silvio returned with mushrooms and some wild fruits. Eleonora also brought back the empty plate, she and her mother had finished off the crispy fried bread. Alfred and Barbaros heated oil in the pan, waiting for it to reach the right temperature. Once it was ready, Alfred used chopsticks to pick up the bread slices from the tray and drop them into the bubbling oil, flipping them a few times until they were evenly cooked, and then taking them out. While the bread was still hot, they sprinkled sugar on top. As Alfred was generously adding sugar, Bartolo yelled, 
questioning why he was using so much sugar, reminding him that sugar was very expensive in their era. Finally, the batch of pastries was ready. Normally, fried bread should have a layer of white snow from the sugar, creating a perfect blend of crispiness and sweetness in the mouth. The sugar, melting in the oil, sticks to the bread, enhancing its sweetness. Alfred looked towards the door and called out that it was ready, and instantly five heads popped up. They had been standing there since he started frying the bread. Elna stepped forward, seriously asking the maids if the tea party was ready, and upon confirmation, she promptly moved towards the dining room as if she wasn't the one peeking. Then, everyone gathered in the dining room to enjoy the new pastry. Mrs. Elna was very pleased with the dish, affirming that buying the stove was a great decision. Alfred planned to make donuts next time, but Elna said she wanted to enjoy this dish a bit longer and advised him to take his time with new recipes and add more toppings next time. Alfred took note of the suggestions from this major stakeholder. After returning from the dining room, he wanted to make some fried dishes for dinner, starting with tempura. Standing next to Bartolo, Alfred explained that he would dip shrimp into this mixture and then fry them, advising Bartolo to wear a long-sleeved shirt as the oil might splatter. Bartolo, undaunted, declared that he was a chef and a bit of splattering oil was nothing to worry about. But when Bartolo dropped the first shrimp into the oil, he jumped back, leaving Alfred to take over. Alfred fried onions, carrots, mushrooms, wild vegetables, potatoes, and finally, chicken. After taking out the chicken, he fried it again at a high temperature to make the outer layer crisper. Bartolo learned a few new tricks from this. Eleonora and Mina had appeared behind them at some point, and seeing the round chicken pieces on the plate, Eleonora quickly grabbed one and put it in her mouth, only to let out a scream it was still hot. She immediately ran to Alfred, who understood and made her a glass of water with ice to soothe the heat. Reluctantly, Bartolo told her she could take some snacks if she wanted, and Alfred handed her a plate, finally convincing the two to leave. Dinner time arrived, and everyone eagerly looked at the food on the table. After tasting, they all praised its deliciousness, perfectly crispy and balanced. Mrs. Elner remarked that first it was pastries, and now this new dish, she was glad they had invested in the stove. Everyone enjoyed it. But Alfred decided to let Bartolo take the stage next time, feeling exhausted from the day's work. Since returning from the capital, Mr. Nord had been so busy that he barely had time to rest. But thankfully, Silvio was there to help expedite the work. A maid entered, handing Mr. Nord a gift box from Count Dole. Seeing the family's curiosity, Mr. Nord explained that Count Dole was someone he met at the royal party. Since their meeting, Count Dole had been sending gifts. Mr. Nord could have refused, but he didn't want to lose this connection, as Dole treated him well despite his commoner status. Mr. Nord further explained that Count Dole's territory was in the southwest of the capital, known for its high-quality cloth and being the nation's major supplier. To put it simply, Count Dole had a great fondness for dolls. Indeed, upon opening the gift box, Mr. Nord found a knight doll inside, a doll modeled after the knights of the Misfright Kingdom. Seeing Alfred's interest, Mr. Nord gave it to his son. Elna, after holding the doll, also liked it and suggested writing to Count Dole to request another one and to send a thank you gift. Alfred, holding two dolls, walked down the corridor when he heard Mina and Mel's voices. It seemed they were sharing a ghost story. The story was about a maid who had to patrol the mansion. One night, even though there was no one around, she heard footsteps behind her. When she turned around, no one was there, but she could still hear the faint sound of footsteps in the dark. She ran as fast as she could, but for some reason, the footsteps seemed to get louder and closer. She ran and ran until she couldn't anymore and was forced to look back. The next morning, her lifeless body was found lying on the floor. Mina narrated the story with visible fear, especially since it was her turn for night duty. Alfred felt a sense of dread, a ghost story about dolls. So, ghost stories existed in this world too. He looked at the doll he was holding and thought of a plan, a really good one that would surely surprise everyone. Alfred examined the two dolls he was holding, thinking he could make them move using his spiritual power, but it was harder than expected. He guessed the clothing material made the legs heavy. Taking scissors and thread, Alfred adjusted the night doll's attire, and it stood firmly, even walking sturdily. 
He practiced walking to control the doll better. While practicing, he met Silvio and showed him the walking doll, which still looked unnatural. He asked Silvio to walk for him to observe and improve the doll's movement. After several trials with Silvio, they applied the improvements to the night doll. The doll walked naturally and even hugged Silvio without falling, an achievement that brought tears to their eyes like a father witnessing his child's first steps. Caught up in their success, they were called for dinner by a maid and Alfred put away the doll. That night, Mina was patrolling the mansion with a lantern. Suddenly, she heard the same thump-thump footsteps behind her. She whispered to herself to stay calm. Entering the library, she found it empty and breathed a sigh of relief. But then, the door she had just opened closed on its own with a bang, sending chills down her spine. There was no wind, so how did the door close? Mina was terrified. Seeing three rooms ahead, Mina told herself to quickly run there and knock on the doors. The sound of footsteps thump thump behind her grew louder, and she ran faster. She tripped and fell to the floor, the situation eerily similar to the ghost story she had told. She thought if she looked back now, people would only find her lifeless body tomorrow. Unable to resist, Mina turned around and saw a figure thankfully, it was Eleonora. Overwhelmed with relief, she burst into tears. Eleonora looked around and asked if it was Alfred. Instinctively, Alfred ran, guessing Eleonora couldn't spot him in the dark. He planned to throw the night doll at her, thinking she would be caught off guard and he could escape. But reality struck hard when Eleonora, holding a sword, swung it down as he threw the doll, slicing the night doll in two. Alfred was first shocked, then despairing, tears streaming down his face. His night doll, which he had trained to stand and walk just the day before, was now torn to pieces. Eleonora scoffed at her brother's tears over a mere doll. In the end, Alfred was scolded for waking their father up in the middle of the night and had to compensate Mina with sweets. On a bright day, Alfred sat drawing portraits. Eleonora, appearing like a ghost behind him, startled him. She peeked to see what her brother was drawing. Alfred replied he was just drawing people around them, like Sarah doing housework, Bartolo doing heavy work, and Mina cleaning windows. Eleonora was surprised and asked how Alfred could see Mina since she wasn't there. Alfred said he watched Mina every day and could draw her from memory, except for her maid's outfit. Eleonora grabbed the drawing and ran outside, only to see Mina actually standing on the second floor, exactly as Alfred had drawn. She challenged him to draw an animal or monster. Alfred agreed and soon, a very lifelike and animated smile creature appeared on his paper. Eleonora, not to be outdone, said she could draw one too. Snatching the pen and paper, she quickly drew another smile. Eagerly looking at Eleonora's drawing, Alfred disdainfully asked if this was a new species. Not satisfied, she suggested they have a drawing contest. The drawing contest began, starting with a portrait of Sarah, who quickly sat down for her portrait. Time passed, and finally, the siblings completed their drawings, presenting the results. Alfred drew Sarah, while Eleonora drew Bella. Alfred joked that Eleonora's drawing was surely a masterpiece of a monster pig, which led to a series of slaps from the subject of her drawing. Mina commented that Alfred Sama's drawing was better, to which he beamed with a triumphant smile telling his sister it seemed he was the winner. Eleonora, in disbelief, looked at her own drawing and then challenged Alfred to draw her. He immediately refused, saying how could he possibly draw the demon lord drawing her beautifully was a big challenge in itself. Eleonora looked a bit sad, expressing her wish to have a portrait like Sarah's. Seeing his sister's expression, Alfred was surprised but teased her not to get angry if she didn't look as pretty as Sarah. Predictably, she flared up, insisting both she and Sarah were beautiful. Reluctantly, Alfred turned over the paper, preparing to draw her. Knowing Eleonora wouldn't sit still for long, he had to draw quickly from memory. A while later, Alfred presented his work to Eleonora. Seeing the first few drawings, her face darkened, her hand clenched into a fist, as they all depicted her angry moments. Alfred pleaded with her to look at the next ones. Patiently flipping through, she saw different moments of herself, her eyes sparkling with admiration. She couldn't stop praising Alfred and immediately ran off to show everyone. The first person she wanted to show was her mother, Mrs. Elna. 